This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Many, 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 are listening to the Voices of Wrestling podcast with your hosts, Joe Lanza. That is out. Go listen to some boring podcast where, where they're afraid of their own shadow. Okay? Don't listen to Joe Lanza because Joe Lanza's not changing. And Rich Craig. <laughs> Give me a name. I want to. Who delivers <laughs> this guy in a big spot? Joe, don't yell at me. In the, in the big spot, who delivers better than this guy? Just stop yelling at me. I agree. And we are live here on the Voice of Wrestling flagship podcast. I'm Rich Craig, alongside, as always, the king of banter, Mr. Joe Lanza. Joe, what's happening? I've already lost Joe, I guess. <laughs> Can you hear me, Joe? No, I'm here. There I'm you here. are. All right. What's happening? How's Texas? Yeah. Everything's going great out here. I was muted. A very quick mute. <laughs> I was like, come on. That's... Uh, forewarning. Okay, we, we, should, we should preface this show. Uh, Joe lives in Texas. So far, you have been good so far, right? You, you got no issues, no power, internet's been fine. Uh, we cannot guarantee that that's going to happen, given the state of the state of Texas right now. So, as of yeah. now, you've been good, <laughs> but no promises. We'll see. No, I've been very lucky. I haven't had power out at all, not even for a minute. Um, I haven't had my internet drop at all, even for a minute, at least that I'm aware of. So, um... You know, probably during this three-hour window, something will happen. But um, we'll just, I don't know, try to power through and and uh, and do the show. Yeah, so, so if, if randomly Joe gets disconnected or randomly something happens, that's, that's probably why. Uh, I do want to also uh, let people know that my internet has been uh, pretty iffy. Uh, as of late, I have all my all my cable wires are on the outside of my house, and the outside of my house currently has uh, three or four... Uh, I don't know. It's about two, maybe about two to three feet of snow uh, pressed up against it. So uh, my internet and my cable have been pretty weird uh, so far in, in, in the last few days, and and go, going in and out and not perfect. So we'll see. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Everything sounds okay, and we don't drop off or have uh, any periods. But uh, there's really nothing I can do other than get out there with a shovel and dig up you know three feet of snow and put it some other place that I can't. I have nowhere to put the snow. I I, I have nowhere. I have nowhere to do this. The entire country is is. Filled with ice and snow, and, and uh, it's a disaster. I guess California and, uh, I don't know, anybody else okay? Everybody else kind of... Hawaii, I guess, is probably fine, too. But They had the uh, Pebble Beach Golf Tournament this past weekend, and that looked that, that weather was beautiful. So <laughs> we wherever go there, were, yeah. It <laughs> Pebble Beach is uh, fantastic. I've driven, in that, I've driven through that golf course uh, once before, and that was... Uh, that's a... Man, if I had X amount of money, <laughs> you know, we played that game a few weeks ago. Uh, that is certainly a place that you'd want to go, other than, you know, of course, the future for uh you know the other power outages and the whole you know earthquakes and the whole you know california flooding and, and falling into the ocean thing other than that it's pretty solid so here's that highway that runs right next to the course right Isn't yes that- yeah so you have highway one which runs right next to the course and then if you pay i forget what it was maybe it's a, it's such a fuck these assholes but they they got me it's like you pay like 15 bucks or whatever and then you can drive through there's a highway that goes through the course as well and okay, it kind of weaves in and I... out. So yeah, you have Highway One, which is awesome. Like that's just an incredible. It's it faces the coast the entire time. It's 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 honestly the part about Highway One is I'm thinking, oh yeah, Highway One's gonna be awesome. I can't wait or whatever. Well, I'm just like two hands on the wheel, scared as hell the entire time because you're like you're driving in this two lane highway and the one wrong turn and you're off a fucking cliff. You know what I mean? Like so, I'm not enjoying any aspect of this drive whatsoever. And Michelle's like, oh look at that. Oh oh look at that. Oh wow, that's really beautiful. That's really nice. I'm like, all right, sounds great. Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm currently you know going seventy turning and, and the only side of this thing is a cliff. Uh, and I'm terrified of heights, so that uh, that part kind of sucks. But yeah, then you could get to the Pebble Beach area and then pay X amount, and then you could drive through the course area too, which is pretty nice. So it's like a what is it, a private road that they then monetize? Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's awesome. That is tremendous. I wish I could build a private road like in my backyard. <laughs> you had a place that was nice enough to yeah. and monetize that. Just you, you give you know the listeners would pay. I bet the listeners would pay. absolutely drive through Lanza's backyard. It you know. 
that right there, that is my uh, dining room window. Uh, to your right, you will see uh, the grave of my dead dog. To the left, you will see the fence that uh, my neighbor replaced and uh, I had to pay 70% of because, yeah, it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be perfect. I mean, I know the listeners would pay to drive through Lanza's yard. Everybody gets a bag of M&Ms on the way there, too. So Chocolate, of course. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a wonderful experience. No, really, if you could monetize a, a, a private road and get people to pay to drive, well, I guess every state does that. Yeah, I was going to say highway the highway like, system is pretty. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't really invented anything new here. Now that I think about it, it's one of those things where you're talking yourself through an idea, and then you have an epiphany that someone stole that idea long ago. Like you know, that, that's not even uh, close to a unique idea. I many years ago, you know what my my uh, million dollar idea was to that I thought nobody had thought of. It was a laundromat slash sports bar because I figured that would be perfect for like single men. You know, you go do your laundry, but you could also get drunk and watch the game. Right. And I told anybody who would listen about this idea Mm -hmm. and I'm saving money. I'm going to open up a laundromat slash sports bar because there is nothing worse than, than I, I I've most of my life had washing machines, but then I lived in an apartment for a few years and we had like some downstairs, like really grimy ass, uh, you know, laundry room. But sometimes if it, it would barely fit anything. So if you ever had to do big loads of laundry, you'd have to be, you know, run downstairs every 20 minutes and change all the shit. It was, it was stupid and it was, it was dumb. So I went to a laundromat and, and I used to do that pretty frequently. And you, you're onto something because there is nothing to do there. There's weird, it's just you and a bunch of other weird people. I guess you could look at your phone. There's a TV that's playing probably something in another language <laughs> you know what i mean insert yeah. and it's not always the same language like one time i went to a laundromat and it was you know they were watching like indian television and i didn't think i was allowed to say hey can we put on espn like hey. no it's just because whoever's there grabs a broomstick and flicks the old school dial to whatever channel they want and then they just leave it when they leave so it's, it's always like an old tube tv it's yeah oh yeah like a you can't TV. even see it you can't even hear it it's just absolutely horrendous it's been a long time since I've had to use a laundromat, but I, I, that's something I never want to go back to. It's just a humiliating, terrible experience. And, and you're right. You have nothing to do, and you're stuck there. Um, oh, you're getting feedback, aren't you? A little bit on your end, yeah. I was, yeah, if you'd want to – unrelated to the uh, the power outages there. <laughs> there we go. I, you're good now, I think. Or you just went away. But <laughs> I think you were good. Uh, real quickly, as, as Joe kind of fixed his mic there um, – Jeremy mentions here we have uh, we have bar laundromats here in Las Vegas and they're in the worst part of town. So, also some in Reno, Nevada. I am not uh, surprised at all that the Duds and Suds Laundromat Plus Bar uh, exists in Reno, Nevada. That is uh, fantastic. All right, Joe, how are you sounding? You not tell great. me. Not great. <laughs> I'll be honest. Not great. A little scratch still. So that's. Oh god! This is gonna be, this is gonna be an god. utter disaster. This is the worst. Oh god! I think we're good. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. So far, yeah. That was after that excruciating noise. That is now. Um, this is gonna be. I don't know what's going on. I had the same issues um, last night for the paywall stuff. So uh, this is just gonna be an utter nightmare. So um, I don't know. We're just gonna have to fight through it. I'm gonna have to keep an eye on it. Um, but yeah, that turned out not to be a unique idea at all. As you can see, they're everywhere. So, um, yeah, we got Reno, Nevada. We have a few people saying they Southern Indiana. They were there, uh, New Orleans, yeah. many a weekend. I, I like the idea. I have never seen one personally. It's probably just not allowed <laughs> in my area, but, uh, it sounds awesome. So is it like, what is it more, or at least in, okay, let's not, not what the ones are, but what was, were you envisioning more? Are you more of a bar or more of a laundromat? Because I feel like you, you you can't go right down the middle. It's got to be a little bit of both. You know what I mean? Or, and and no. one of them has to be a little bit stronger than the other. Wrong. Right down the middle. Laundry, one half of the building. Bar, sports bar, the other half of the building. Because you're stuck there for at least like two hours if you're doing laundry. Right. So it's, it's enough time to watch a game. It's now, enough what's time the, to get like, What's like the lighting situation in this place? Is it fully – because the laundromats are usually fully lit so people can see everything. But like sports see, bars usually are confused. not. You're not you're not like drinking a beer and eating a burger next to the guy folding his clothes. Like that would be done in a different area. Oh, okay. So you walk through like a different area, a door maybe, and there's the bar. Right, but there's gonna be TVs everywhere. Got it. See, 
the TVs are going to be in the laundry section as well as in the bar section. But if you want to eat and drink, you got to go over to the bar. So you throw your clothes in the washer, you go over to the bar, you sit down, you watch a game, you get drunk. Uh, you can even get like a little, they can even have like a little monitor that tells you when your wash is done. So you, you know when to go over there and throw it in the dryer, you know, and then same thing. Like those little beepers they give you when your table's ready or whatnot. Sure. You know, in, in a restaurant, you, know, you, you set up a system like that. That I also discovered was not a unique <laughs> idea. I wish, and, I wish they did have that because I, I live, you know, I, I occasionally have to go. There's a laundromat right around the corner for me that sometimes if I like a, I'm cleaning like a bear, I'm trying to wash, you know, a big comforter or something like that i have to put it there you have to put you know different things and they have like a a strict like do not leave policy like you cannot go you have to stay with your stuff and one time i was like i mean fuck there's no one here i live literally a block away i'm just gonna go home i came back and the the asian woman that runs that laundromat was not she goes you know you cannot leave and i was like i know i'm sorry like i was like it's not like it was very competitive like there was like three people when i showed up the next time there's like 20 machines there was three people but her idea is that i was taking up a machine and then me leaving and deciding i'm too good to be here uh was was a slap in her face and maybe i mean maybe it was and maybe it was but uh um you know They're what am i gonna terrible. do there what am i gonna do he, <laughs> he fucking vending machine skittles and, and watch a tube tv playing something in another language like come on what am i it's it's awful and there's always like six chairs for 170 people. That's the other thing, too. Like, you know, it, it's it's just an awful – it's hot. They're always – no matter no matter what the temperature is outside, it's at least 25 degrees hotter inside the laundry Oh, room. yeah, and all, sort of, all sorts of, like, infectious diseases running through that place uh, as well. COVID may have started at a laundromat for sure. There's and just like – and who knows what kind of dirt bag had their clothes in the washer before? <laughs> That's something you know? I think about a lot, yes. I think about that constantly. And there's nothing worse than, like, opening up the dryer to throw your clothes in the dryer, and there's, like, a sock left over from the last person. You want to pick that thing up with a pair of tongs. Like, you, you don't want to touch that. Like, that's just horrifying to me. Like, I would wait for another dryer so I don't have to touch the random left-behind sock from whatever ne'er-do-well left their sock by. I don't even want to touch it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to touch it. It's always grungy looking. It's just a nightmare. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. I think if something happened to my washer and dryer, I would sooner wash my clothes in a sink than go to than go back to a laundromat. That's fair. Yeah, no, that's definitely fair. I remember the one time I uh, or the other the other terrible thing too is like you pick a dryer and it's just like filled with other people's clothes and they're they're always just like Ugh. the weirdest looking clothes too. You're like, oh, who wears? There's just like it's always like there's always just like used panties, you know, that fly out immediately and you're like, oh god, and they like fall on the floor and you got to pick them. I hate. Yeah, laundromats are terrible. I, I would just prefer never to go to one again. So ah, oh, there's nothing worse than touching someone else's dirty clothes. Ugh, yeah, don't even want to think about it. Um. Hey, you got to go get the quarters, and then if, like, the exchange machine isn't working... And they never are. <laughs> have they ever worked at any laundromat how, ever? How have they have? How have they not yet modernized and just let you swipe a card? I know. Instead of putting I quarters know. in these machines. Well, and that's, like, when I lived at that apartment, like, they... they so they installed a, a card machine, and I was like, oh, great, well, now I can just go down there. The card machine worked for literally a day, then it had a do out-of-order sign on it, and then for the next three years, it was just back to the quarters again. <laughs> like, I'll never forget that one day... Where they finally let you use the card, uh, and then I came to find out that they said, "Oh yeah, no, 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 but uh, you can use the uh, you can use the uh, laundry machines at uh, this apartment. We also own this apartment. That's like seven blocks away. I'm not walking <laughs> with my laundry yeah. for seven blocks to use a card. Like it's fucking ridiculous. So then I would have to do the thing where like I'd be at work and I'd be like, "Oh, I may better make sure I get quarters on my way home from work." And that's not easy to get these days. Try to go get some quarters. Like it's it's not very easy at all. I guess a bank you could go into a the drive through of a bank and they'll probably give you a, a, a sleeve of quarters or whatever. But yeah. It, it ended up being me buy. I would go to like Seven Eleven and just buy like chips and a drink and give them like the worst denominations of money, and then just beg the yeah. man to like instead of giving me a five, just give me the five and quarters. And he's like, "Fuck you! I'm not giving you a five and quarters." And yeah, it was just a, it no, is. He wants his qu- he wants his quarters too. Everybody he's does. Like, yeah, quarters. anybody that works retail or restaurants or anything knows the the value of the quarters are are ridiculous because people always want them. People always want them back. You, you always have enough nickels. Everybody in the world has always had enough nickels. Nobody ever needs a nickel. But, man, those quarters are just like – they're gold. Well, they, they do so much. <laughs> I'll tell you why the laundromats don't modernize the cards. They want it to be a cash business. You know, you could uh, 
it, it's just much better if it's cash business because then you can, you know, you can uh, yeah, yeah, take a little off the top. Yeah, skim a little bit. Whoops. You know, a little <laughs> Whoops. Bit. This envelope you know? fell on the floor. <laughs> Guess I'll pick no, this one up. Nobody's reporting all that, you know? So you, you, you got that advantage. Plus, you just make, you know, straight deposits to the bank. You don't have to pay a percentage to the credit card companies. It's just, it's so much easier to just run the straight cash money business. And you can, uh, no pun intended, launder money for your sleazy friends. There you go. Don't think that didn't cross my mind when I was thinking about my laundromat. <laughs> of course. Slash sports bar, you know, because uh, I knew some shifty people in those days. I figured, oh, listen, if I'm running a, could, half of this business is a cash business. Literally and figuratively wash money through your uh, through your business. So good. Correct. So I was really thinking ahead. But um, it turns out it was not a unique idea at all. And um, obviously – it never happened. We actually have one right in town. It's called Harvey Washbangers. <laughs> one in town. Harvey Washbangers. Big Milwaukee yeah. Brewers fans. Big uh, 1983 uh, Milwaukee Brewers fans, I see. so Maybe. I mean, those were the Harvey Wallbangers. Ah, right, but I right, get what right, you're right, saying. Right, yeah, but yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Gorman Thomas and, uh, and Cecil Cooper, get, right? Cecil Cooper, yeah. Uh, you know, that whole Paul gang. Molitor during Ro- his 15 years of being awesome. So Robin Yount. You know, that was the uh, Harvey Wallbangers, 82 Brewers. But uh, Oh, that's 83 yeah. and 82, yeah. You, you knew what I was saying, so thankfully. But uh... Listen, yeah, I knew what you meant. Absolutely. You know, 82 is the year that went to the World Series. Yeah. Cardinals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm into this. Uh... I can remember that kind of shit. <laughs> but if you ask me, <laughs> if you ask me, like, what was on Raw last week. Joe, what was, no... what was the last World Wrestling Entertainment pay-per-view? I legitimately don't think I could tell you three matches from the last WrestleMania. But if you ask me WrestleMania 2, I give you the whole card, whole what card, city yeah. each match was in. <laughs> right, right. Who hosted Why it? Is that? Like, where where St. James was versus or St. James was versus uh where you know everybody. Is. is it just a matter of an but but you know, it's not just wrestling though because okay, I had instant recall of the 82 World Series, right? But if you told me if you said Joe, who was in the 2014 World Series? I could get it right, but I'd have to think about it. Why is it that you can instantly recall? Like, are you the same way or no? I, like, I absolutely I am. am. No, I, I definitely am. And I think a lot of it is when, you, when you're kind of in your formative years, and, and, and me particularly. Like, I would, in my early, you know, youth or whatever, I would just, I'd pour over magazines and record books and, and, and just, like I said, the PWI Almanac. I would read that thing cover to cover, and I'd, I'd get to the end of the cover, and I'd restart. And I'd reread it for 20 times in a row for no reason whatsoever. The, you know, the yearly almanac that had all the results from every wrestling show ever, you know, throughout, you know, throughout the years or whatever. I would just read every single line of that. And I remember my dad had like a uh, – it was like a Super Bowl book about every single Super Bowl. So I know all the Super Bowls. Dude, if you told me who was in the Super Bowl four years ago, I'd have no fucking idea. But I could absolutely – like I remember who was in, you know, this Super Bowl, that Super Bowl. You know, who was how many times the Raiders were in it. I, I, like that's – because I used to – pour over that every single time and, and like so i think it's got to be that and like nowadays you just kind of I, I don't know i or maybe the other thing too is maybe we try to consume so much information now that so little of it actually gets retained it is a possibility especially yeah. us doing what we i mean we, like because back in those days you would really like hone in on a few different wrestling companies a few different things all that stuff. dude we watch i mean on this week alone we're going to talk about like seven different wrestling promotions like it's impossible to remember that all it's also investment too i mean because i i went back i have every uh, Fighting Spirit magazine review that I ever wrote, you know, saved in my Google Docs or whatever. And every now and then I'll go through them and it'll be like 2015 tables, ladders, and chairs or whatever. <laughs> and I'll read through it. And Rich, I don't remember a fucking thing from any of these shows. Not one thing. Like even reading back the reviews, it doesn't even ring bells. Like I'm reading words that I wrote. About matches that I watched twice. Because back then I would watch the shows twice when I was writing these reviews. Because I just wanted to be accurate and whatnot. And I don't remember shit. That has to be just lack of investment in WWE. It has to be. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, there, there's, you know, we I, I, I probably told this story a few times as well. That, you know, we used to go to the Squared Circle, the uh, Victoria's. Uh, wrestling bar in Chicago, and and they would have trivia like every single Wednesday or whatever. Myself and Sean Flynn, former, uh, well, he, he pops up every so often on the uh, Voice of Wrestling podcast network. Uh, he, uh, him, and I would go there, and we would just—I mean, we never got questions wrong. And we would just like every time we'd go there, the people would be like, "Oh, here come these guys again! <laughs> like, great, here's these assholes going to win the game again." And we would, you know, never get anything wrong. We'd always get everything everything right. Like, some, you know, one or two times we'd get something wrong or whatever, but more than more than not, we would get everything right. One time, the question was. 
uh, name the Intercontinental Champions from 2011 to 2015. And it was just like, uh, <laughs> we yeah. could, you could ask, tell, ask me, name every Intercontinental Champion from Pat Patterson until, you know, fucking 1997, and I could have done it easily. No doubt. This was like, just name anybody who's won the Intercontinental title since 2011, from 2011 to 2015. And I think we did, we got Kofi and Dolph, and then I don't, and like, I, you know, I, it, it, was, it was like, I don't know, I don't know. Mason you know Ryan, who knows? Like, whatever. <laughs> that, that's what your mistake was. At that point, stop trying to think about who the champions were and just start naming Just people. name people, yeah. Yeah, we were trying to th- – we were doing our head. We're like, all right, so Co- – and it was like, dude, we can't do that. We should have just – yeah, you're right. We should have just named 30 roster members and probably would have been more accurate. Yeah, yeah. The Miz is always a good choice for any title. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Miz, Edge, uh, Kofi, and Dolph are, are pretty universal throughout the last 20 years of, of, of uh, old – uh, world Wrestling Entertainment. Well, speaking of World Wrestling Entertainment, let's 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 get off the top uh, uh, here. We are going to talk about NXT in a little bit, but they had a fun week of stories, baby. Oh man, did WWE have a fun week of stories? Uh, you have the uh, the confirmation that uh, the wrestlers cannot uh, promote anything outside of their wrestling likeness, also in their real life, which I guess <laughs> is very interesting and fun. But we don't want to talk about that. Whatever. That that's an aside. We got to talk about these two stories. Just incredible stories back to back. Just a banner week for Twitter and a banner week for people to just throw their phones in a fucking body of water and never think about them ever again. Uh, it started off, I think two days ago, maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, I forget exactly when it was, but Fox, told to be on Fox, put out a tweet, the very innocuous $15 social media game. And, and, and Joe, I know you know about these. I know about them for people that don't know about these, these $15 social media games, or sometimes it's $10. Usually it's 15 is every single dumb, account in the world that talks about sports or talks about wrestling or talks about movies or talks about video games or comic books or literally every other account in the universe has used this exact same thing a thousand times because it gets instant instant social media engagement so if you're like you're running the mill social media intern will say ah why don't we do a 15 dollars game thing with these guys so the nba example is always you know build your nba super team and your five your five dollar guys are michael jordan lebron james and wilt chamberlain and and you know uh tim duncan and this guy like you know what i mean and, and then you kind of go down the list and it's okay you're supposed to, have to make these tough decisions of oh man well you know I, I need to build this team for fifteen dollars, and I need to you know pick five guys, so I can only pick one guy that's five dollars, and three, you know, th- yada yada. Let's see, th- that's the basis of the game. Am, am I identifying it right, or do I need to explain it anymore to to people? Well, I think unless you're a sheltered, thin skinned <laughs> WWE wrestler, right, right. Like I feel stupid that I even have to explain it to you people, but I guess uh, given the the what has happened this week, I guess I do have to explain it to some people in the world, including uh, people that work for World Wrestling Entertainment. Yeah, it's, it's it's one of them dumb engagement memes. You have $15, pick your squad. And then, you know, everyone has a value ranging from $1 to $5. It's it's everybody, unless you live under a rock or you have never been on social media in your life, is familiar with this engagement <laughs> meme. Which, so... <laughs> which leads us to our point. That's So that WWE on Fox account does this $15 game here, and uh, they, they tweet this out. Uh, let me find the exact uh, – <laughs> oh, man. So they deleted it, and it looks like I can't find the actual original. They deleted it. It said it – said, I'm gonna tr- Someone that has to have a uh, screenshot here. So I want to make sure I have everybody that's in the uh, – okay, I got it. So build your team for $15. This is build your WWE team for $15 outside of the women – uh, here, so five dollars. You have Becky Lynch, Bailey, Sasha Banks, and Charlotte Flair. Four dollars. Oscar, Io Shirai, Kaylee Ray, and Bianca Belair. Three dollars. Rhea Ripley, Nia Jax, Shayna Baszler, Alexa Bliss. Two dollars. Naomi, Lana, Dakota Kai, and Raquel Gonzalez. And then your one dollar tier: Liv Morgan, Ruby Riot, Peyton Royce, and Natalia. So <laughs> the response yeah. from so hold on, yeah, so hold on. Pretty decent tiers. Not bad. I mean, Kaylee Ray pretty... at four dollars is tough, but I they they're doing all the champions. A, I get it. I she's get a it. Champion, so right. they put her on the four dollar line, so that's fine. This was a decent representation of the level of push, and I thought they did a good job with the tiers. Well, the only thing because with the if tiers, you ever too, these, no, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. If you ever see these things outside of wrestling, that's how they are. Like if you see it in you know with basketball or or football or whatever. Uh, you know, the stars are $5, and then it works its way down until you get to the $1 tier. And I think they did a decent job with the tiers. Here's what they did wrong, though, the account. They, they tweeted? Didn't give you any... They tweeted? 
Well, yeah, well, of course, that's always number one. <laughs> but they didn't give any rules or parameters. They just said, here's $15. You have to say, here's $15. Who are the four people or the five? Who's your five person squad? Right, which is what always works best with like basketball. Basketball probably has excelled the most in because it's, it makes you make that tough decision of, okay, here's the tiers. You have $15 and you need a full starting lineup. So you need to pick five people. Whereas this just said build your team for 15 bucks. So you could just say, all right, well, Becky, Bailey, and Sasha, they're done. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. Well, you, they well, want you to make those hard decisions. I, yeah, they want you to make those hard decisions. Exactly. But if you don't have any parameters, I, one of the first replies to the original tweet, some guy was like, well, you didn't tell me how many people I could take, so I'll take the bottom two rows and Rhea Ripley, and I have nine people now, so no <laughs> one's going to beat me. Right. You know, it's just – you have to have rules, and they didn't even give parameters, you know? So he's got a nine-person team, you know, led by $3 Rhea Ripley, and, uh, you know, he's obviously going to dominate. But, yeah, normally they have rules where you have to pick a certain amount. That's the whole point of the budget. You have to make tough decisions, and you can't just take all the best people like Rich did. Or you can't take an entire army like I just did. So that was their that was uh, another mistake that they made. In addition to tweeting it all. <laughs> so then, uh, all the natty by nature got on the notes app. <laughs> Usually, these notes apps are are tend to be uh... natty by nature. <laughs> So usually the notes are, are an ominous start to what you've done uh, outside of the ring that is now causing you to never be able to wrestle ever again. Uh, this was, a, uh, I guess, a, a better uh, notes app here. Uh, where, uh, Natty by nature. <laughs> <laughs> only topped by my favorite, yeah, only live once. <laughs> That's my other favorite. Anyway. Uh, quote, I've struggled for years to figure out exactly what my worth is. So at this point, don't you got to look in the mirror and go, all right, well, hold on a minute. I, could, I got anything else better to do it with my day. Go pet a cat. Go see what Tyson's doing. You know what I mean? Like, okay, anyway. I've struggled this for years to figure out. This is already gross. <laughs> yeah. I... This is already gross. I have to tell you to stop already. This is like the gimmick where I tell you to stop. I, I have struggled to, to come <laughs> for up with years my worth. to figure out exactly what my worth is, but I won't allow anyone to pick that number for me. As hurtful as seeing this is, I want it to be known that if I ever find myself under all these wonderful women, it's because I am a pillar and a foundation hurtful. of what we're doing. Please keep the one dollar because anyone who knows anything knows how priceless I am. Dash N K N Natalia K Neidhart. Yeah, and she left the like blinking cursor. Yeah, on the just drone, to let like, you for know. the next yeah, yeah. yeah, she really <laughs> dropped the mic. You're not gonna hurt Natty by nature. Uh uh-uh. uh. You're not gonna tell her what her value is, Mister. So we got uh, at Alexa Bliss underscore WWE that says, yeah, I'm not a big fan of this tier thing either. Love you, Nat. Dewey Foley, who I thought Dewey had a little bit more sense to this. but uh, Nah, he's an absolute geek. <laughs> he says that last sentence is perfect. There are people who actually know how this business works, and there are people who think they know how it works. For those who understand it inside and out, you are priceless. <laughs> Oh, God, gross. Uh, WWE is the bump host, Kayla oh, Braxton, K- at oh, Kayla Braxton. Somebody please, please. Will someone please Kane Dewey? Yeah. I, it, it has never been more apropos to dig up that. that oh, oh, you are priceless. He really said that? Yes. Yuck. What a nerd. For those who understand it, inside and out, you are priceless. At do we have to. Uh, WWE's the bump. Uh, WWE's the bump host, Kayla Braxton. Uh, Kayla Braxton at or at Kayla Braxton WWE says, "Love you, Natty. Your leadership skill, drive, and influence are your sorry. Your skill, drive, influence, and heart are priceless." Well, not really. She's she's one dollar. I mean, that's that's the price. She's the Price is Right bid. When you know you think you're outsmarting the rest of the panel, one dollar. That's what Natty by nature is. She's just gonna have to deal with it. Oh, my God. I can't believe he said she's priceless. <laughs> oh, my God. What? It's just gross. It just makes your skin crawl. Yeah. Could you imagine if there was like a uh, $15 meme tier for podcast hosts and like you were on the $1 tier and I didn't even make the thing like I'm not even on it and you're on the $1 tier and I tweeted that out in support of you. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, Rich, don't let anyone define your worth. You are priceless. You know what I mean? You would quit the show. That'd be the end of this show. That'd yeah, be the end I would. Of the yeah, show. I really would have to consider if I really want to go on with the show after that. You'd never talk to me again. And quite honestly, I couldn't even blame you. You know what I mean? Like, I'd be like, you know what? You're right. That was that's an awful thing to tweet. 
I, I'm, I'm the worst. I should be fired into the sun. How can – do we have to – like <laughs> – how does he – I don't even – I don't know. You may continue. I can't even take this. Uh, what, all you, right. The, yeah, the Bollywood boy says, you and TJ have helped us immensely over the last oh, several months. Oh, God. The Bollywood boys. <laughs> Who needs to hear from the Bollywood confidence. boys? We appreciate <laughs> – thank you. <laughs> Do you think that was Bollywood one or Bollywood, <laughs> Bollywood two? two. Uh, I, I I don't know if they got maybe they got together with it because this is a big deal when someone's coming at you know Mother Hen Natalia you gotta everyone's gotta get all all hands on deck here I, I'd imagine you know so. what it is all of the one dollar tier geeks came out to support each other is what it was because I saw Shelton Benjamin too yes He's another he was the next tier. one I was gonna say at WWE on yeah. Fox you should erase this insulting post and apologize oh to every God. woman on the roster like imagine imagine Ben Wallace getting upset about where he's at in this <laughs> you know what I mean like. <laughs> Yeah, he's in his fucking yeah. mansion. He's just like, I don't, whatever, dude. Who gives a shit? Like, whatever. Oh, and then Tim Duncan being throwing his phone across the room because <laughs> he's a three dollar. He's like, God damn it, I'm a two time MVP. Are you kidding? Three dollars? Like, yeah, yeah. Could only imagine. These are real human beings. Um, let's see here. Oh, Shelton got into. It. Oh man, he was really getting into it. No, uh, yeah. Shelton started replying to people. Yeah, he's he's no. he, yeah he's he's got people at him and he's going back at him. So. Uh, oh boy, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll leave him there. Uh, you get Carmella's, you get a uh... oh, yeah, yeah. Peyton Royce says, Seriously, uh, oh, ooh, hold on, TMZ man had something to say. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> oh, actually, no, <laughs> all right. I know you don't love y'all only live once, but uh, yeah. she quote tweeted the uh, WWE on Fox thing and said, This is almost as bad as at Ryan Satin's tier list. Yeah, she actually just had friendly banter about Yes, it. yeah, and then Bailey says, guys, it's not real. If it was, they'd spend the whole $15 on me. Ha, ha, yeah. ha. Yeah, see, people who, like, aren't sheltered and get Yeah, it, live outside of the universe, like, of the, the literal WWE universe, actually got it, yeah. You could totally see people like, it's Bailey, and you only live once, <laughs> existing outside of that bubble and understanding the meme. Like, one thing I'll say about Ya Only Live Once, she clearly understands meme cult. I wouldn't doubt that at all. No, like she no, has seen this sure. a million times before. You know what I mean? So they're just having friendly banter about a very stupid and meaningless meme. Meanwhile, all these sheltered, thin-skinned dopes just cannot help themselves, and they're tweeting about this. Do you have any more? Because I know there were more. Yeah, Mark Cardona. Were... Uh... <laughs> oh, Cardona. Oh, he's the worst. <laughs> He's always you know ready. Uh, he put here, what an asshole yeah. thing to tweet. So Yeah, yeah, because wasn't his uh, – because, like, his girl was left off completely, Yes, right? yeah, Chelsea was, was nowhere to be seen. She said I hey, – uh, I think she said I must have been in the uh, the priceless category or something like that. So. Well, quite frankly, she is worth the zero dollars <laughs> based fucking, on those tears. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> she's, she's nobody. She's not even, like, on the ro- – she's, like, hurt. She's not even on the roster right now. So she's correct. She is worthless at this point in time. When she comes back, maybe she'll get on that $1 or $2 tier. But uh, it's just like Cardona, he's another one. I'm sure he's never seen this. No. If you ever listen to his podcast with the wrestling toys with uh, Myers, right? Yeah, the major, Myers, yeah, major figure or whatever, the major figures toy or whatever thing. Yeah, yeah. I watch their YouTube videos at night sometimes as background noise, you know, because it's interesting. And uh, Myers also collects the old starting lineup figures. And as you know, oh hell yeah, weird. my man. Yeah, I got. I'm looking at a Dikembe Mutombo starting lineup figure right now, so. Yeah, and as you know, he's a big sports fan. He he's had wrestling gear made to look like you know the Mets colors and things like that. Big Mets fan. I think he's a Mets Jets Islanders guy. Oh, nice. York, that's a that's a solid combo. That I respect that combo. Like you know you know what I mean. Like that's that's you, you know you, really easy to just you know pick one of the two. Or I mean that's like Long Island through and through right there. I love. Well, it. Well, if you know any, well here's the thing. If you know anything about New Yorkers and the New York uh, area. You're either a you're either a Giants, Yankees, Knicks, mm-hmm. or which I don't Mets, respect those people at all. Those people are terrible. Or, so. or a Mets, Jets, Islanders. Yes, like, I respect those, those people because they 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 have to deal with some shit. I mean, obviously the Islanders had their their run, but uh, between the Jets and the the Mets, it's been a it's been a tough little run for those guys. So those are those always tend to go together. Like ninety percent of the time, if you go to New York and somebody is a Knicks fan, they're probably a Giants and a Yankees fan. If someone's a Jets fan, they're probably also a, a Mets fan. It just it's just seems to be the way it goes. But at any rate, he's a big sports fan. And whenever he brings up like the starting lineups or something like that, Cardona has no idea what he's talking. <laughs> just completely lost. Oh, hold on. I got the boy here. What's going on, boy? Daddy. Yeah. Daddy, I'm 
smoke fire because I cleaned my room. You cleaned up your room real good? Yeah. So mommy's getting you a new Buzz Lightyear? Ooh. Yeah. Oh, how about that? You see? You do good. You clean your room. And, uh, you know, you, you get a little taste. That's how it works in life. Good job. You take a bath, too? High five. All right. Look at that. That was a good, that was a good sound of high five. Nice. Yeah, he's got his Spider-Man jammies on. Look at this guy. Yeah, we didn't have water. <laughs> oh, this is the first bath we've had for a little while, so yeah. that's good. Well, yeah, we didn't uh, have water for a You can tell me everything's half, fine. So. You didn't have water. That's not fine. You're like, yeah, everything's fine over here. We're good. <laughs> you didn't have water. All right. <laughs> good night. Yeah, no. All right. Good night. I love you, too. Good night. So, no, we didn't have – we had electricity and internet. We just didn't have water. We didn't have water for a day and a half. But fuck the water. I need my internet. (laughs) Right. Water comes What am I going to do without internet? Like I can drink Coke 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 Z. Yeah, Coke Z is still coming. So that's fine. Now, I'm not going to lie. I have some really bad ass grease right now from not taking a shower for two days. But, you know, what are you going to do? I've been been using the baby wipes. They're very helpful in these situations. So you Michelle know. has uh, she brings them to the hospital sometimes. There are these like big wipes that you can you can essentially take a shower with these wipes. I forget what they're called, but they're they're pretty handy. I used them once when we were on vacation, and they you actually do you do rel- feel relatively clean with them. I was actually kind of surprised. I was like this has got to be because they look like baby wipes, so you're gonna think that they're gonna give you that idea of baby wipes, which you know you can kind of you know you can clean some some parts you know with the baby wipes, but it doesn't ultimately feel like you don't want to clean the whole body with baby wipes. That kind of feels weird. Uh, but these ones were fantastic, so I can I can definitely recommend. Uh, those I, I I enjoyed your trans. I, I guess I'm not ready for children yet because uh, uh, when your guy came in here and, and and whatever he said, I didn't hear a I didn't understand a word he said, <laughs> and you translated it perfectly. So I uh, well, was it not to you. was it not clear no? It's just like he, he's a child, and I don't understand how kids talk. <laughs> like I just can't understand yeah. children at all. So it's. Yeah, no, yeah, he was talking. Well, he's a big toy. St- he's into the toy story. Yeah, he's I thought he was a Woody guy. Has he has he t- turned over to no, to, I- to Buzz or he just both of them are fine. No, he's a big Toy Story mark, so he enjoys um, all of the characters. He dresses up. He wears that Woody outfit. Yeah, oh, does he wear it, like, all the time? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, it's just part of the regular rotation. He just puts that on, like, the Woody costume. Like, I'm wearing this today. Okay, go ahead. You know, then his mother comes home, and she's like, why is he wearing a (laughs) Halloween costume? And I'm like, because dad is fun. And yeah, you're not gonna deny. It. Who cares? Yeah, I like. I always see like sometimes you'll go to the grocery store and you see like a a little girl in like a princess dress, and I'm like, you know what? Sure, whatever. <laughs> like I'd be that way too. If you want to wear the princess dress today, fuck it. Let's wear the princess dress today. Who cares? Who are you impressing? You're four. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So I let him wear that. But yeah, uh, no, he's. They, we've been you know shelled, we've been stuck in the house for five days, six days, or whatever, and their rooms were a disaster. And she's been on him to clean the room. So she bribed him. He's smart. He's four. He already <laughs> he understands gets it. He the gets it. He knows the score, yeah. So he waits until TLB says, we'll go on the phone on Amazon and pick you something out if you get your room. They know that she's going to say that. And I always tell her, you know, you can't, you know, it, they're hustling you now. You know, they're, they're working the room here. So, you know, that's what he did. And now he's got this shit eating grin on his face because uh, she made the deal with him. So he went in there and cleaned the room and he picked out a new Buzz Lightyear off Amazon. Fantastic. So, there we go. You know, when this snow melts, it'll get here. <laughs> right. When, they, when the cars can drive again, then uh, it'll get here for sure. Now some poor dope is going to drive off the road trying to bring this Buzz Light here year, uh, here in a FedEx truck or something, uh, you know, because this kid cleaned his room. But, uh... <laughs> Dude, so and, th- and that, that annoys me to no end as well with the uh, with the Amazon thing. Because, like, so I ordered – I needed a, uh, a a humidifier for my desk, <laughs> as dumb as it was. So my I have a desk humidifier because it's very dry at my work. So I ordered another one. So I ordered it on – Christmas Eve because I was just sitting around doing nothing. I was just kind of sitting, you know, it was the morning, nothing was going on. So I ordered this thing and it gives me two options. It gives me get it today or get it in two weeks. Yeah. And I was like, fuck it. Come on. I don't want it today. I don't want some guy to have to drive to my house on Christmas Eve to drop off a USB desk humidifier. But I also right. need it before two weeks from now because I'm going back to work in like two days. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. like, there's got to be an in-between option. And I try, I couldn't find one, so I was like, God damn it. So fucking three hours later, <laughs> there's this guy. There you dun, go. Dun, 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 dun. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm, yeah. so, I'm Listen, so sorry. I'm so sorry, sir. Like, you know. See, you live in like near Chicago, so you have like – the option for that day that's incredible oh dude it's it's ridiculous yeah. it, it'll like they they for a while did the things where they would do it like in an hour or something like that 
they pulled back on that because I think that was just like that was like Domino's Pizza style, where like the guys were probably driving off the road and stuff and like getting in flaming yeah. wrecks or whatever. But now they're like guaranteed in three to five hours, and it's almost always like the three hour. They they know they can hit that three hour for the most part, but they give you the the the, the five hour just in case. But yeah, it, it, it's it's stupid how quick the, it, it it gets here. It's like actually I hate it. I actually hate how stupid it gets here. How stupid fast it That's gets. Incredible. To my house. That's incredible. That's incredible. You know, my new kink is ordering Doritos flavors that I can't get locally on Amazon, and uh, and paying an exorbitant markup. For them. <laughs> what are what are the good what are the good finds recently? I, I, I'm a fan then, of uh, Chikara Doritos as well. So, and then always clicking, yeah, I want that shit the next day, every <laughs> fucking time. You know, there, there's no reason. I'm like, yes, I want these salsa verde Doritos in my belly tomorrow. That is, correct. oh, those are fantastic. Are, are, yeah. are those the ones you actually recently got? I've gotten – I've tried them all. I mean if you go on Amazon right now, you'll see all don't, kinds of – I don't really want to do flavors. this. I really should not do this. But And and the markups are insane. Like the more rare the flavor gets, it's like nineteen ninety nine for like a standard bag. But I pay it. But I pay it because this is my kink. This is my new – they've got me, Rich. They've reeled me in, uh, especially since I know it will be hand-delivered to my door the next day. It's incredible. There's never a day that goes by where there's not a stack of Amazon packages because TLB is just – you know all the, 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 the Amazon residuals we get from the code? That's all from this house. Yes, I was going to say. I think, just, I think most of it is from you and Sean Sloan. So. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, but yeah, so uh, – but now, I mean, he's not probably not getting this Woody for, for a week and a half because they're not, they're not making deliveries right now. You just can't. They're, they're, they, they don't plow the road. We don't have plows in Texas. <laughs> You cannot plow the roads, and there's no salt. It's not in the budget. We haven't had weather like this in 50 years, so they don't have plows. They don't have salt. So the roads are just – it snows, and then if it drops below freezing from there, the snow then freezes, and the roads are just literal white sheets of ice. You can't drive on them, and everyone's just stuck in their house. It's insanity. Um, But, yeah, what were we talking about? Cardona. Yeah, that guy's lost. Yeah. That guy, <laughs> I think you were trying to say that, like, when they do sports references, he has no fucking clue. He has, he has like, no He's got clue. nothing clue. He's got no clue about anything besides pro wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Brian Myers will be like, yeah, so I got this uh, I got this Daryl Strawberry starting lineup on the card. And Cardona's like, who's Daryl Strawberry? <laughs> like, he's lost. Christ. He doesn't know anything, you know? Like he's, he's, you think he's, he'd be he's, a better pro wrestler given that it's all he really cares about in life, but I guess whatever. It's fine. So it's like I believe that he's never seen this meme because it's usually sure. around sport. You see him in movies. Yeah, I was going to say like yeah, you know, superhero movies. I see it a lot. I see it all in, in MLB and, and NBA. I see it a ton. But every sport, NFL. There's literally one going out about NFL free agents today. It's like fucking every day I see these. Like it's unbelievable that these geeks didn't understand this and freaked out and were, were giving virtual hugs to Natty and I'm sure real hugs in, in, in real life. And, and she appeared legitimately upset and WWE had Fox had to delete the tweet and people had to tweet at them. How disgusting and ridiculous. It's so, it's so Rich, pro wrestling. Have, it's so pro wrestling. Just I have sheltered z- weirdos. I have zero sympathy for her. She's just a thin skinned number one sheltered idiot. The thing about it is it's not even like Natty Neidhart. That's a dollar. It's, it's fictional character. (laughs) Natalia. Who hasn't had a a title shot in decades. (laughs) It's it's not even you as, as, as a skeech in our chat room pointed out, did a farting gimmick for months. Remember what you farted? Yes. That was fine. That's okay. Right. But don't put me on the one. Don't put my fictional character that I portray on the one dollar tier. I mean, at least with like Ruby Riot that, made fun of her dad dying. I forgot about that one. Remember that story? Yeah. It's like when <laughs> oh, they that's do these okay. things. When they do these things with athletes, that's the real person. When they tell Tim Duncan that he's on the two dollar tier because he wasn't as good as Kareem or Bill Russell or whoever the fuck, or they put him behind Shaq, and he's got an axe to grind because he thinks he was better than Shaq, okay? That's really what Tim – That's Tim, that is Tim – that's who he is. That's what he did. That's what he was. These are fictional characters. That's how thin-skinned these people are. Ruby Riot is not a real person. All it is representative of is your level of push. That's all that was. It doesn't mean that Becky Lynch – it's worth more than you as a person. What's wrong with you, you dope? How stupid can you be? So no, I don't feel bad for her. God, it just it's it's it, 
why don't why doesn't do we have to <laughs> have like uh, why doesn't he just school her on the fact that there's no just be lighthearted about it why don't you tweet out hey i'm a value you could get me for a buck that's, that's I, honestly model. i've seen i've seen some athletes that's the way they usually uh handle it is like ah one dollar huh, that's a great value for one dollar <laughs> they don't care it's it's whatever yeah they don't give a shit i i, I, I couldn't believe only in pro wrestling would you yes. see You've seen, look, do you remember the one that was going around? I mean, you see them in all forms. Build the ultimate Sopranos crew. And it's like all the Sopranos characters. And Tony's $5. And, you know, uh, and, and whoever the fuck is 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 a dollar. You know, and, you know, Tony's $5. And maybe Paulie Walnuts is $4. Maybe Vito Spata 4 is $3. Maybe Carmella is 2 bucks, And then all the way on the bottom, you got like bit players who maybe got killed off in one episode for a buck. You don't see those actors – writing heartfelt notes app messages talking about that they know their value as a person <laughs> that they've struggled with for years. They're on to the next gig. They might not even remember filming the episode. These are fictional characters. Rich, I can't take it. <laughs> What's wrong with these people? It's so bad. Well, the hits kept coming uh, the next day here, another uh, banner day on, on Twitter.com. As, uh, so after uh, NXT last night, a, uh, a report came out from a fan at the Capitol Wrestling Center, Joe, uh, that Kyle O'Reilly was suffering a seizure after NXT went off the air. Uh, so fans got very concerned. Uh, different websites you know, started posting stuff as quickly as they could. Uh, Wrestling Inc. Raj from Wrestling Inc. I'm just I, I'm all, I'm I'm only using him because I don't know if he was the main one. I wasn't awake when this was all going on. Thank God. But I'm just using him because he's embedded here. Uh, who who tweeted out at 11:18 p.m. a minor update on Kyle O'Reilly. Adam Cole is with him, and he is responsive. So that came out at 11.18. Uh, and by 11.40, though, things started to get a little bit more under control. Ryan said at uh, TMZ guy here, uh, from what I'm being told, Kyle O'Reilly did not suffer a real seizure after NXT tonight and did not suffer a medical episode. According to WWE sources, it was all just part of a storyline. Happy to hear he's okay. Uh, Raj would then say, got to confirm Kyle O'Reilly was just selling the attack. It was a work. They didn't even anticipate that people would think it had to do with O'Reilly having type 1 diabetes. I forgot that he was type 1. So, okay. Joe, I, for one, cannot believe how disgusting. I mean, it, if if we're going to start having our wrestlers fake that they're hurt or that they're injured when they're not actually hurt or injured, I – what are we doing here, really? Uh, you know what I mean? You know, in it's, all it's, serious, Come on. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, it's uh, – people – modern wrestling fans just don't want to be worked. You know, and, and I'm not even making a value judgment. I have my own thoughts on it. Uh, but that's just so, I mean, you, you see it here. You see it with, now, first of all, if you notice, you were sleeping. Okay. I was awake. There are no tweets about this from the Voices of Wrestling account until it came out that it was a work and then I mocked it. But there are no tweets about it because I laid low because I just had a feeling that something was amiss. I'm looking at this situation and I'm saying to myself, the only piece of evidence that this man had a seizure was from a fan who was at the taping, who took four grainy, you know, Sasquatch in the wild quality pictures of Kyle O'Reilly, like, you know, on a gurney. And then saying, I think Kyle O'Reilly had a seizure. You know, I'm paraphrasing. None of the WWE tweets mentioned the seizure. In fact, none of the WWE official account tweets even mentioned the angle. Because I think they were filming the angle for social media later on or maybe for NXT next week. The only thing on the official accounts was uh, the brain buster on the stairs before they did the angle. Oh, now I got the girl in here. All right, I'm getting another run in. That's fine. What's, hey, going, on what, what's going on with her? What's she getting for free? What? What? Oh, well, I love you, too. Are you getting ready for bed? Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. You were just jealous because Nolan got to come in and you didn't? Mm-hmm. Yeah? I know how that goes. So you wanted to get uh, your little piece of attention, too. You want to say anything? Everybody's listening. No. Now you want to <laughs> say nothing? No? Doesn't run in the family, I guess. She didn't. <laughs> all shy all of a sudden? Mm-hmm. Yeah? What do you got on? You got your jammies on, too? Yeah. Yeah, what are they? What's on there? It's a unicorn. Oh, it's a unicorn? Yeah. yeah. You took your bath too? Yeah. You feel clean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, 
I don't know what's left to be said. Oh, you're going to help cook dinner? Oh. Oh, all right. Making steak? Yeah, I can't wait. I'm hungry. Why don't you get cracking on that? All right, guys. It's the run-in zone tonight. There you go. Hey, yeah, yeah. This never happens. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened here. The boy came in, and that probably – she saw that he got over. Mm-hmm. Got his right? moment of glory. You talked about the Buzz Lightyear. You talked about the toy. Yeah. He got a big pop, and then he went out there and was probably talking about it, <laughs> you know? And she's like, well, I, you know, I want to – you know, this is a good opportunity for me to get over. So then she comes in here, and, you know, she wants – see, she had nothing to say. I mean, just – Nothing. I mean, I should say I love you. I mean, I guess that. I mean, that was pretty nice. But, but I mean, you know, at least he <laughs> nothing had tangible. Tell- nothing tangible other than I love you. <laughs> no, well, like he had something to tell me. You know, he, right, right, he right. Had, he had a purpose, a reason to get in there to tell you, hey, this is what's happening. I'm giving you the update on the on the house. Yeah, yeah. Like cleaning the room has been a running storyline going on in the house, and and you know, he hit the finish. He cleaned the room, so he had something to tell me. You know, he had the report back. She had nothing to say. So clearly she just wanted to come in here because she saw that, that he got over with me because, uh, you know, I gave him the high five and everything. So then she wanted to. I forgot about the high that's five. Yeah, I forgot about the high five. That's, so that's he probably went out there and was like, oh, you know, daddy, give me a high five. So, you know, now she got to commit. So that's how it. that's how it always is. You know, one of them gets over and then the other one wants a piece of the action, you know. So, eh, I don't know. Nice little run in. Um, what the hell was I talking about now? Uh oh, that you were awake during during all this, but we didn't tweet anything while it was going on. Oh yeah, because I I kind of sensed I was like, this isn't right. Like this is just coming from one fan. It was one fan tweeted out that Kyle O'Reilly had a seizure, and then everyone just ran with it. It just shows the power of of Twitter. Like this wasn't any. Per- this was just a fan speculating, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna lay low on this one. So everyone's wishing him well. They're hoping that he recovers and waiting for updates. You got reporters tweeting stuff. Oh, we're looking into this story. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to lay law on this one. Then dark Twitter lit up. So dark Twitter, about a half hour before WWE fed Ryan Satin to kind of cool everything off. Dark Twitter was already on top of it. And we had a little note passed to us that they were like, oh, this is a work. This is a work. He's he's reading all of these tweets as we speak, and they don't know what how to handle this. There's going to be apologies issued. Then a half hour later, after they clearly fed Ryan Satin, who's their house organ, Ryan Satin sends out the tweet saying there was no seizure and it was an angle. And we've reached the point in pro wrestling where you can't even do angles anymore. No. Because if anybody gets worked, you have to apologize for it. And that's problem number one with this. Problem number two is everybody just took the word of this fan because this fan used the word seizure. Everybody just ran with it and assumed that this man had a seizure. This isn't WWE's fault. All they did was run an angle. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, it's... You can't run an angle anymore without having to apologize for it. It's ridiculous. You know? Uh, you know so, I mean, that's where we are now. People don't want to be worked. If this were 1980, you know what they would have done? They would have said, "Oh shit, we lucked into some. Let's lean into this and say, yeah, he did have a seizure. Yeah, let's oh, say and, he's and laying in the hospital. They're bringing a camera. They're bringing a camera to a hospital or a local medical facility. Kyle Riley's going to be at that local medical facility. Adam Cole's cutting a promo in front of that local medical facility. You know, like saying, "I'm glad I did it. I'll do it again." You know what I mean? Like that sort yeah. of. Yeah, Kyle O'Reilly but sitting in the hospital bed, going, "When I come back, I'm going to be stronger than ever." Adam Cole, I'm never going to let you forget what you did to me on this night. You know. Right, but if I say. Oh, WWE should have leaned into this and 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 ran with Kyle O'Reilly having a seizure. I guarantee you there's people listening to us right now going, Oh my god, are you sick? That's gross. What's wrong yeah, with you're you? Gross. That's gross. You can't exploit that. That pro wrestling is all about exploiting <laughs> you emotion. You can't exploit fake injuries in pro wrestling, Joe. You just can't. It's ridiculous. I mean, Kyle O'Reilly was so good at his job last night that he fooled at least one person into thinking he had a seizure. And then what you can do is three weeks later when he returns from his seizure, he, you know, he gets a big pop and he's like, well, we don't have fans. But he gets a big pop and he's over and maybe you, you luck into creating a star for once. You know, and, and it, but you can't do that anymore because fans don't want to be worked. And I'm not here to say 
whether I think that's a good evolution or a bad evolution. It might be a good evolution that we don't exploit something like that. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm more on the side of fuck it. Just I want to be worked. We had these same discussions with Shibata many years ago. But what I do know is the modern fan has no interest in being worked. We saw it with Eric Stevens and Black Label Pro. Where the same thing. He had to come out, break character, and apologize for a wrestling angle that people didn't like. You know? Uh, we're seeing it now with Joe Alonzo. Very similar angle that he's trying to run. Uh, where he's wrestling a woman and he's doing like the male chauvinist thing. And he's getting all the wrong kind of heat for it. When it's very obvious that the opponent is in on it and she's probably going to beat him. But people don't have any interest in those in, in certain kinds of stories and they don't have any interest in being worked anymore. And again, I'm just noting the change and the evolution in that. You know, I don't know, you know, I'm not saying where people should stand. I'm not saying people are wrong for not wanting to be worked in certain ways. But I know for a fact that people don't. Everyone wants to be in on the work now. They want to be part of it. The wrestlers are their friends. They, they need the wrestlers to be good people, even if they're heels. Which is why it's so hard for people like ELP or MJF or, or some other people who are committed to their, to their characters to get over his heels without getting like this wrong kind of heat because, you know, people want wrestlers. They, they want the wrestlers winking back at them and uh, they don't want to be worked and they want to know that the wrestlers are, are good people that they can be friends with. And I personally have no interest in that. I just want to be entertained. You know, I, I don't give a shit whether Joe Alonzo is a real life misogynist or not. I know he's just doing a storyline here. And if it's good, I'll like it. If it's not, I won't. But it's the same thing here. It's like, you know, people would think it's classless if Kyle O'Reilly did fake a seizure and work the fans. You know, because you have fans saying, oh, well, I'm diabetic too. And I, you know, that's, uh, you know, I, I would, that, that's class. It would be class. And, you know, that's just the, the way things have evolved now. You have to apologize for doing pro wrestling angles that are too convincing. And personally, I, I think that's bad. I, I, of course, there's lines you can cross. I'm not saying that there's no lines that cannot be crossed. Because you can delve into bad taste. This was not, though. WWE did nothing wrong. They didn't say he had a seizure. They didn't uh, lean into it at all. Because now I, I even – people dig their heels in, Rich. Because then you have people saying, oh, well, why'd they wait two hours to clarify? Right. Oh, that's what they want you to well, think is that it wasn't a real seizure. <laughs> it's like, oh, Yeah, God. and now they're saying they're working the work. Like, oh, they're working the work. And now it's like, okay, this is not Inception. Okay. All that happened here was they saw that it had spiraled out of control. And because of the times they're in, they had to clarify. And it took them a couple hours to figure out how to handle it. That's all. Why? Because they didn't want to ruin their angle. And when Kyle O'Reilly finally tweeted, he basically stayed in character. And yeah, he said, oh, I, I have a tweet have right here if you want me to read right, it. Yeah, go ahead. yeah so yeah. it's uh, Kyle O'Reilly says, Thanks everyone for checking in. Your love and support truly means the world. I was placed on a stretcher last night out of concern for my neck after receiving a brain buster on the steps. Uh, thankfully, I can move around somewhat okay today, but I may need some time to heal. Uh, as much as that hurt and sucked last night, the betrayal was worse. Coming back from the stronger and with a thirst for revenge, best served cold. Right. Because he's a pro's pro and he doesn't want to completely blow his angle, but it's too late. I mean, they had their they had their house organs send out what a, essentially was an admittance that there was an angle with you know. Um, so it's like you can't you can't work the fan. The fans don't want to be worked. They they they, they want to clearly know. They want you to wink at them and they want to know. That every day, they, 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 it's, it's almost like fans are, I don't know if too smart for their own good is the right way to phrase it. I don't think that's it. I just think it's, fans are almost insulted when they get worked now. You know, they don't want to admit that they have, that these, that wrestling has an ability to work. Them. Right. And, and, and I think one of the other the problems too, is it immediately like when, when, the, when people do get worked or when a company tries to do it, it, it's not necessarily like, you're right that they don't want to be worked, but then it's also this like. 
this referendum on how gross and disgusting and wrestling used to be and how we don't need to do that anymore. You know what I mean? It's always this like, yeah. it has yeah. this weird undertone of like, well, that's what they did in the past when wrestling was, you know, crappy and garbage and smoke filled, you know, ruined. like we've moved past that. We're progressed past that. It's, it's got that weird undertone that like getting worked is like, oh, well they're low brow. That's like low brow pro wrestling garbage and stuff. And it's just like, okay. I mean, that's what the whole game is. And, and I don't know. I mean, I much preferred it in that era that I do now. So I don't know. I guess I, I, I enjoy the work, but uh, you know, it's not just a WWE thing too. I mean, we, we, we for years would argue with people on, you know, every G1 Hiroshi Tanahashi would, would you know, share a picture of a, 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 you know, bruised bicep and say, Oh, uh, my biceps torn, but I'm still going to wrestle in the G1. And then, you know, Zack Sabre Jr. Would have a match where all he did was kick the bicep and people would go, Oh, that's great. I mean, uh, new Japan just forces these guys to wrestle when they're hurt. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, yeah. like, why do you think he's limping in every, every single match that Tanashi says, oh, I have a torn MCL, and every single match is his him limping and the guy working over his knee the entire time, and then he overcomes the odds and wins, and then he ends up winning the whole G1, despite having a torn MCL. So weird how that happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the old days, they definitely would have tried to take that genuine concern for Kyle O'Reilly and turn it into money-drawing, um, you know, sympathy, but I don't even blame them for snuffing it out quickly because you can't do that now if they would have leaned in people would have revolted could you imagine what today would have been like if they leaned into the seizure and then started building a match like people would go crazy so again i don't even i don't even think wwe was at fault for putting out the fire because in the times that we're in you have to because people just aren't accepting of being worked in those ways anymore. And it's like, I sent out that joke tweet about the, the famous angle with junkyard dog in mid South where the Freebirds blinded him with hair cream. And the whole basis of the angle was his wife was pregnant and the Freebirds cost junkyard dog, the ability to see his newborn daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Blinded him with the hair cream and the fans were incensed. You know, because they bought it, and you know, and 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 they did a cage match. I think it was a cage match. Dog, it was either a dog collar match or a cage match. Might have been both. Might have been a dog collar match in a cage with Junkyard Dog versus Michael Hayes as the big payoff to that. You know, and it's like it, it, it sounds a little goofy and over the top now, and I, I'm not sure anyone would buy that someone was blinded by hair cream in 2021 but it's all along the same lines i mean it's it's playing off of people's emotions you know but there, you can cross the line like uh fritz von eric faking heart attacks and things like that i mean sure. that's cross right, you know, right, right. It, it's a fine line it's a, it, because in that case all of his sons had died already and now this guy is like feigning death that's a little classless you know it's it, so it, there's always a line and i suppose the line is different for everyone and maybe for some people, uh, that, that lead, now here's the thing. The intent of Kyle O'Reilly wasn't to fake a seizure. That was just one fan. Right. That, he one just sold in a way that made that fan think that he was having a seizure. Maybe. I, I, you know what I mean? Like, who knows, you know, at this point. But, like, I've seen Kyle O'Reilly sell a lot. I've seen D- – Devon Dudley was a very famous – every time he took a bump, he would sit there and see, kind of have this, like, weird seizure-looking thing in the ring. But, like, yeah, now – like, that's – I mean, it's really – it's everyone's fault is just, like, immediately saying – because this one dude said seizure – just going with the seizure thing and going, oh my god, Kyle, I hope you're okay. I hope you're... It's just Twitter's the worst game of telephone that we force ourselves to use every single day because we're idiots. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're so dumb. And like, it's just maybe let's get a few more people saying, hey, yeah, it was a seizure before we decide that it was a seizure. Like that seems like the responsible thing to do as opposed to you know getting your quote teats out there and getting your praying hands and hearts going out. You know, let, let's let's maybe reel it in a little bit. Well, that's the other part of this. The other part of this, which is kind of independent of fans don't want to be worked anymore is you know the perils of social media and like you said it's more important to get those prayer hands and hearts out there so all of your followers know what a great person you are than to you know find out what i mean this is pro wrestling and they are actively trying to work us yeah, professional liars they are professional liars never yeah. forget that <laughs> which and i'm not trying to pat myself on the back but rich i didn't tweet a word about any of this because i just it felt I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I immediately knew it was a work because I didn't, but I wasn't sure. So I said nothing. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you rather not put something out there 
and then be wrong and look like a dope. But it's like, I'm just assessing this in real time. And I'm like, this is just one fan tweeting this. Are we sure that this man's life is in danger? You know, and do I really want to contribute to this by tweeting out my heartfelt fucking thoughts for Kyle? No, I was very, because especially since it's not really a personal account that we have, we have to treat ours a little different too, because people see us as a news source, whether we like it or not. So I wasn't going to be tweeting about Kyle O'Reilly's seizure in any way, shape or form until I had a little more information because I don't want that shit bouncing back to me. Oh, well, Voices of Wrestling, uh, they were saying they hope he's all right. And I'm like, they, they have source. I don't want to deal with it. It just was sketchy from the start to me. And then, you know, it didn't take long before we started to find out that they're, they're, that it was, you know, it's, it's just crazy, you know, how one tweet from one Twitter user, unknown, not even like a blue check mark, not another wrestler, just, <laughs> just a Twitter dude, user. Just a dude at the Capitol Wrestling Center. <laughs> And then you had other wrestlers, and that's really when dark Twitter started to investigate because um, Isaiah Swerve Scott put out a tweet in character saying, oh, I guess Kyle O'Reilly's in the hospital next to Leon Ruff because he's a, you know. Yeah, yeah. But not I, a heel tweet. I like it. I like it, yeah. But he had to delete it because people <laughs> were getting on his case. You're disgusting. He's backstage. How dare you? He's probably with Kyle. He's probably He's next to working. him. He's probably sitting at the catering table with Kyle O'Reilly. You know, at the same time that's happening. And that's when smart people said, "Okay, let's look into this." Yeah. Because this guy's clearly working. And again, if this were 40, 30, 20, even 15 years ago, that would be considered good heat that that swerve was getting. As right, they'd be backstage looking at their phone, high fiving each other about how they're they're nailing it, yeah. and thinking about we okay, what are we gonna do this week? What are we gonna do tonight? All right, oh okay, Kyle, get get we'll get you to a hospital. We'll get Adam. Like you know, they'd be up all night then planning how we're gonna maximize you know this angle instead of crafting an apology or, or, or you know having to delete what we said before to make sure that people know that you're actually okay. It, it, it's it's wild. It, yeah. It's, he had to, he you know he, he's a heel and he had to delete his tweet for saying that he was glad this guy was in the hospital. You know. And then there were some other wrestlers, you know, tweeting out well wishes. But here's the thing. A lot of them probably weren't in on the work because why would you be? If you're a random NXT wrestler who works the opener, why would you be privy to the main event angle? You go home when your work is done. You know what I mean? It's like, so I kind of understand it from that perspective too. Maybe they need to do a better job communicating all the angles to people. But at the same time, it wasn't even. Yeah, it was just Kyle selling something. You know what I mean? Like, even yes. if they said, "Yeah, Kyle's going to get attacked after the match, and and then he's going to go out in a stretcher." Okay, there you go. That's different than Kyle Riley had a seizure and he's in the hospital. Like, that's a big difference. Yeah, that that's what I mean. At the same time, there's no expectation that this was going to blow up because it was just a standard injury. Angle. Right, right. So why do you need to inform Dakota Kai? You know what I mean? Like, there's no reason to. So then you even have Dakota Kai last night tweeting out, "Oh my God, get well soon, Kyle O'Reilly. I hope he's okay." I mean, I hope to God she tweeted, she texted some people first before she, you know what I mean? Like she can find out, you know, and I, I don't mean to throw her under the bus. Maybe she did know it was a work and was just also working. But it's just crazy how powerful Twitter is. And, and you really do need to be careful about what you tweet for reasons like this, you know, just a wild story and just so interesting on so many levels. But, um, yeah, it's just uh, – and this is a situation where I don't even – I don't find WWE at fault for anything no, no, in this scenario. You know, they did nothing wrong. They ran, a, they ran an injury angle that, by the way, didn't even air, and they didn't even tweet it out. <laughs> the show ended with the suplex into the stairs. They didn't show the aftermath. I assume they were saving it for next week or maybe for the next day on their website or whatever. You know how they do things. Um. But now that I, it's out the window now, I mean, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's crazy. It's a, it's fucking, it's wild. <laughs> it's, it's a different business. It's a, 
it's a very very weird business uh, these days and, and a few people in the chat room put up you know something that I, that I kind of agree with as well you you didn't bring it up you brought it up a little bit and I don't want to you know belabor the point and, and, and talk about it a bunch more but there's also this thing that and and, and we've talked about this a lot of times where I, I think it's an unhealthy thing that's going on right now between wrestlers and fans where uh, fans think that they're buddies with the wrestlers and in some cases the wrestlers want that you know relationship where they're buddies with the fans and the problem that happens with that though is that yeah when, when you have this idea that like, the wrestler Kyle O'Reilly is you know ha, you know it, it, it I know Kyle oh we're oh my god I love Kyle we're friends we're buddies you know like it, 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 there's a different sort of relationship than when you know Hulk Hogan in the 80s would would get hurt and it was like well he's it, it's it's just different I mean obviously the Hulk Hogan stuff was was you know with the earthquake and, and the get well Hulk and all that sort of stuff was like it was all really popular and really but like there's just a different feel these days like you said where you got to be out there and you got to tweet out right away to prove that like you know with your your, your prayer emojis and your hearts to, that like i really do feel for my friend kyle and oh my god i hope he's okay and it's just like he's just a wrestler man like just you know he's a pro wrestler he's a professional liar like you can like your wrestlers you can and there's some guys again that you you can be friendly with but this there's this this want and this need and this desire to to like you said to be winked at where, where you wink and they wink at you the entire time. And it's just, I don't know. It's, I don't think it's good. It's not good for wrestling. No, it's, it's the merch table culture that we always talk about, uh, that we've been talking about for years that I think played a factor in some of the speaking out stuff too. It's, um, and you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube, but it's like I said at the top, it's, it's people want to feel like the wrestlers on screen are good people mm-hmm. or people mm-hmm. that they could be fret. They're just, they're entertainers. You know, and, and um, I think, you know, you'd like to get back to where you can draw that line and just take these entertainers for what they're worth and what they're, you know, the entertainment that they're giving you and and not have grander expectations for them. But, you know, social media has torn down that wall and you get to see who a lot of these people really are. And, I, and you know, on one hand, they're real people and they have a right to have put their lives out there on social media and participate in social media like non-celebrities do. But on the other hand, it, it, it has changed the wrestling business and culture at large in a lot of ways too. And I think a lot of the smarter, not just pro wrestlers, but entertainers period use social media in, um, in, in a, in a, in, in much wiser ways, strictly for self-promotion very little personal thought because I think they understand that, you know what? I'm not a normal person. And unfortunately, unless it's my locked private account that only my friends and family know about, I cannot treat this medium the way that rich Krejci does. I just cannot do it, you know? And, um, others have a completely different mindset. Their lives are just out there and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it does end up leading to broader issues like this where, you know, pro wrestling, it, it has changed the pro wrestling business, uh, you know, on the indie level. And then when these indie wrestlers end up being on television, you know, again, you feel like you're friends with them. You feel mm-hmm. like – yeah, and, and it's just um, – it, it, it really changes everything and it, it leads into this concept of not wanting um, to be worked. And, you know, I agree. It's like – If the angle had aired, maybe we would see those work clues. You know what I'm talking about. The way the announcers are talking. Yeah, the hush tones or Triple H running out there in his street clothes immediately and, you know. But we didn't get to see any of that because it was an angle that was shot for later. So that also contributed to uh, the mass hysteria that broke out as well. But in reality, it was simply one tweet. And I even think if that tweet didn't have the word seizure, none of this happens. Because immediately people would have had their 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 work radars up. Oh, well, it's a stretcher job. It's pro wrestling. Let's make sure. But the word seizure is what set all of this off. And it had like this massive domino effect. Just wild. Well, we're going to do a little bit more NXT here uh, as we uh, touch on the takeover. Before we do that, though, I do want to let you know that this episode of the Voice Wrestling Flagship Podcast is sponsored by our friends at Upstart. And you know that credit card, the one that you're afraid to look at to see what the balance is. If you've been avoiding your debt, it's time to confront it right now. Upstart can help you face it and finally pay it off. Last year showed us that you have no idea what life is going to throw at you. And if you use that credit cards to pay for unexpected expenses, it can be overwhelming to manage that debt. 
but you can take control with Upstart so you know exactly what to expect. Upstart is the fast and easy way to get a personal loan to pay off your debt all online, whether it's for paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses. Over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple, fixed monthly payment. Upstart finds smarter rates with trusted partners because they assess more than just your credit score. Uh, They do a five-minute online rate check to see your rate upfront for loans from $1,000 to $50,000. You can get approved the same day and receive funds as fast as one business day as well. If debt is taking over your life, it is time to get a fresh start with Upstart. So you can find out now how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash VOW. That's upstart.com slash VOW. Do not forget to use that URL to let them know we sent you upstart.com slash VOW and loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. So there you go. All right. NXT TakeOver. Vengeance Day. Fun little show. I like the show a lot. It's a good ass takeover. I mean, I'll go a step further. I thought it was a great takeover. There you go. And I had no like personal or emotional investment in any of these matches, and every single one of them still won me over. I'll take that back. I've been into Finn Balor. I think he's been the best. Well, I'll say this: he's been the most interesting WWE wrestler over the last year or so, company wide. So I had a little bit of investment in his title matches because I think he's been killing it as NXT champ. But for the most part, I have no investment in NXT. I have no emotional or personal care for anything that happens. I I vaguely follow the show. I use it as background noise. I just don't think it's a very good TV show. But I still thought this was a great show. I think if the uh, if there was a crowd and I had been more invested, I would have this up in the pantheon of takeovers. I thought it was among the best that they've ever had. I, I would and say, just, yeah, no, I know, and I don't think you're that ridiculous because honestly, to me, and we'll talk about it as we go through the card, like the main event to me was not even like I don't think it was in my top three matches of the entire night, and it was really good. I liked the main event a lot, and we'll talk about it. But there was so much on the show that, that I enjoyed. But let, let's start at that main event and kind of work our way down. I think that's probably a, a good way to do it. Uh, NXT title match, obviously, Finn Balor, as you said, defeating Pete Dunne, twenty five minutes and eleven seconds. Uh, Finn Balor's gimmick is. How do you best describe Finn Balor's current gimmick? He's just like dude that's on the roster and he knows he's good and now he's here in NXT type thing. Kind of, I don't know. And he's and he's running the show and he's got his little crew and stuff. It's it's a cool little angle. There's not a ton to it, but I actually kind of like that. It's just you know he's not on the show that often. He's not doing promos every single time. He just he comes out. He's Finn Balor. You know who he is. He goes in there. He wrestles and he wins. And that's kind of all you need to do with the story. He's a cocky world champion. Yeah, that's it. Who who wants to be there and wants to hold this title? And, um, you know, he's a cocky old school world champion. So, um, he had that, that great, uh, series of matches with Kyle O'Reilly. And I knew that these guys were going to kill it, but I worried about, you know, we're in the pandemic era. So you worry about atmosphere always for any show with the exception really of AEW. I'm always pretty confident in their atmosphere, but for anybody else, you worry about atmosphere. Sometimes it lands, sometimes it doesn't. And it's NXT, so you worry a little bit about maybe melodrama, things like that. But the thing about the Finn Balor matches is he never does that. No. You know, he just goes in there and he has great matches. So, um, you know, that fact, that's, a you know, you don't really worry about that factor with him. Now, the atmosphere kind of stunk. You know, they pipe in, the, they go way too crazy. Oh, with the pipe my God. In. Yeah, that that is my, my biggest complaint probably uh, for NXT lately, and especially this takeover, is the fake. I I cannot believe that of all the companies that do fake crowd noise, of all the companies that do no fans, of all the companies that do semi some fans, all the companies that, that WWE has the worst production value for the. I mean, God, of all the companies that I think would be able to nail the no fans, it'd be this company. But they just they can't help themselves. The heels are like the biggest fucking heels in the universe, and it's so loud. Like Raquel Gonzalez may as well be fucking Mr. McMahon in 1998. You know what I mean? Like just the boos that come through and then like the faces are just jesus christ the rock every single time and it's like dude i know i come on msk is not getting the rock bumps here like like they're not getting pops like that like calm it down a little bit but they do so bad and the booing is like so it's it sounds like a video game like boo 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 and it just never stops and you're like oh my god it's just infuriating to hear it with with the exception of Roman Reigns, who unfortunately was a babyface, nobody in that company has gotten that kind of heat in 30 years. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's just, it, it, yeah, they just overdo it. But, no, the match was great. 
I mean, you know, these two guys killed it just like I thought they would. Um, yeah, I mean, I really feel like if this takeover was in a basketball arena with eight to 10,000 people or whatever, typical NXT crowd, um, you know, old school NXT, hey, you're, you're recapping them all. Plug the paywall, right? Yeah, patreon.com slash voice of wrestling going through the, uh, the first few uh, NXT takeovers. We're kind of going through full sale. I will get all the way to uh, Brooklyn and maybe a few after that as well when they're in the, uh, the actual arenas. But uh, yeah, yeah, those crowds were, were, were next level uh, in those early 2014, 15, 16 days of, uh, of NXT. Yeah, I mean, th- th- I think people would have, re- you know, this would have taken this match up another level. And really, now look, this takeover is getting great reviews. I mean, I think everybody agrees that this was an excellent takeover. Um, but I think that's all it was missing to be in the Pantheon and the great main event. Um, it's always important to have the great main event, especially since I didn't think this, I thought the semi main event was the worst match on the show. I don't know how you I would feel. agree. No, 100% agree. Yeah, far and away to me. So I felt like the main event really had to deliver. Otherwise, this would have been a good show and not a great show, but the main event did deliver. And um, I thought Balor, well, Balor and Dunn are two of the best. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. you forget about those guys because they're in NXT. You know, and NXT is kind of out of sight, out of mind, and all of their buzz gets swallowed up because on Wednesdays, let's face it, everybody's watching AEW. I mean, the ratings show that, but also live, um, you know, people are paying more attention to AEW in real time than they are NXT, and um, it's just, uh, you know, it gets swallowed up a little bit. You kind of forget about some of the people that are down there, but there, there's a lot of great wrestlers in NXT, and um, the, when you put you know, guys like Finn Balor and Pete Dunne, and you just let them go 25 minutes and have a great match with no melodrama, no bullshit, no outside interference, a clean winner in the middle. Uh, they're going to accidentally have a match of this of this quality. Yeah, and and the one thing, and you mentioned the crowd, and I think that really resonated with me a little bit because I didn't I didn't like this match maybe as much as you did. I still thought it was really really good, like tremendous work. But this, I think, of all the, the matches on the show, and the, the reason why I'm maybe putting it behind some of the other ones, is this one to me felt so much like, man, if there was a crowd here going nuts, popping at these kickouts, popping at this, you know, do, like you can just imagine what this match would be like. And, and they kind of, the way that they worked it, they worked it in a main event style. You know what I mean? There were those moments where, like, you could tell that they were kind of down on the ground waiting, you know, for a crowd to kind of make some noise and the fake, you know, NXT, you know, Capital Wrestling Center crowd would make that noise to fill it in. But you know it's not the same. Anybody that's watching knows uh, it's not quite the same. And that, to me, I, I, that hurt a little bit for me is that it, it did feel like it was a little slower pace and it was a little bit more main event style. And I get why they did that. I, I totally understand why they did it. And they did it to, to, to a great degree. I mean, was, again, a really, really good match. But I was just feeling like it, it definitely was hurt by the, the not having a crowd there and not having a basketball arena full of people uh, to go nuts. But, I mean, still with that said, I mean, that's the one negative I can put on it. I mean, there was there was some stuff here and there in the match that I didn't absolutely love. But, I mean, the work was tremendous. And, and like you said, with the, Pete Dun- or the, Pete, or the Finn Balor stuff, is you're you're not getting the bullshit that you were getting during the Gargano Champa days. You're not getting the the bullshit Adam Cole kick out at 97 times type stuff. It's like Finn Balor, you know, they'll have a back and forth match, and then he just fucking puts the guy away. He hits a coup de gras, he hits the 1916, and you're done, and you win. You know, and he he's the champion, and he beat you, and that's fine. Like Pete Dunne didn't lose anything by losing in the middle of the ring. It, it was fine. It was like sometimes you just the simple. He's a cocky champion that wants to prove that he's the cha- the best. He goes in there, he beats Pete Dunn with his move, and he proves he's the best. That you know, it's not hard, and it was a great way to cap off a tremendous takeover. So I, I, I my only real complaint, yeah, just a little slow without the crowd, but other than that, I loved it. His matches have been physical too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Finn Balor. Match. I think you know, I'll go one step further. I think Finn Balor is doing the best work of his career, bell to bell. Ooh, that's yeah. I, you might be on to something because I'm trying to think of the other kind of air, and I never, I never really was. As up on his NXT main event run, you 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 and I used to have kind of discussions about that every single month, where you were a little bit higher on those matches than I were, or that I was. So if you're saying it's above those, then I'm trying to think the only other ones would be the you know the little runs in in New Japan. But even then, those were very short runs where I thought that he was like a truly great worker. The the this is blowing away his first NXT run in terms of match quality. Yes, I agree. The New Japan run once they turned him heel. That was more character work. He was having good matches. Don't get me wrong. The Gato match is my favorite match of that era of New Japan. Bar none. Um, you know, even counting the, the Tanahashi Okada matches. That's my favorite of the era. But uh, match for match, I, you know, I think he is currently on the best run of his career. 
Um, he's had good matches on the main roster, but he's never, you know, the, 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 the Brock match I thought was excellent. One of the better Brock matches, big man, small man, Brock matches that Brock had. Remember where he worked over Finn's midsection or, or uh, Brock's midsection or whatever it was after the table spot. That was a great match. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so he's had great matches on the main roster, but he's never had this to me is the best sustained bell to bell run of his career. And the most interesting from the perspective of he's like a confident world champion. And I think, you know, he really got screwed out of the universal title with the injury, but we wouldn't have gotten this on the main roster. Cause we know how bad the main roster is. And you know, so this is really the only place where he gets to do this because he didn't stick around in new Japan long enough to see where that would have went. So, um, this is his time, and he he might understand that too. He's forty years old. This is his time to really sink his teeth in and be the classic world champion. And he's having matches out of his uh, comfort uh, zone too. I mean, those physical matches with Kyle O'Reilly that was never Finn Balor's style. You know, to 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 beat the living shit out of each other and work stiff and and hard and physical. We saw some of that here too. So I, I'm loving his work right now. I think he's been the best guy in the company over the last year or so. And I think at minimum, he's been the most interesting person in the company uh, without question. You want to quibble. You want to say that Sasha Banks or somebody else has been doing better work than him, throwing a Walter if you want, you know, smaller workload. Uh, but uh, that's fine. I, you know, I won't argue too hard. But as far as the most interesting person in the company over the last year, to me, it's Finn Balor. Uh, NXT women's triple threat match here. This, uh, I, you and I are in agreement. Worst match on the uh, on, on the show. I thought just an actually bad match. I, I thought this match was really, really not good <laughs> at all. I, I've I've seen some people I think be a little too nice to it. Uh, it was Io Shirai, uh, Mercedes Martinez, Tony Storm. Io Shirai uh, gets the win, uh, wins uh, or retains her uh, NXT women's title. Uh, I thought this was really disjointed. I thought it had all the tropes of like one person sit outside the ring, two people do stuff. It just felt like a collection of spots for 12 minutes. It just had no cohesion, no real story. Mercedes Martinez, it's like, what is she even in this match for? There really wasn't a reason. And, you know, she was there obviously to, to you know, <laughs> probably to, you know, counteract some of the stuff, take the pinfall, do that sort of stuff. So, you know, does, you know, does win and, and Tony can kind of then come back and get in. But it's just like, it seemed like it was a lot of work to just get to a Yo know, Shirai Tony Storm match. That, that I guess would be okay, but I'm less confident it would be okay now that after seeing this one because, yeah, there was just a lot of stuff happened in this match, but nothing felt – it just was doing stuff here, moving to this location, doing stuff here, moving to this location, doing stuff here. You have the, the, the blown – you know, kind of the blown table spot where Tony Storm starts to clear off the table and it falls as <laughs> she's doing that, which uh, was not great. Uh, you have Io Shirai doing, you know, big falls off the, the, the trellis and off the lighting grids and sort of stuff. So they, they, like, they worked hard ish in this match it's just like i ultimately i just i don't know what the point it was just a bunch of things happening in a match i, I don't know i just had no flow or cohesion to it for me no it wasn't good it wasn't a good match uh the table spot was a bad break and it really sucked the life out of it even with the announcers trying desperately to cover for it but that wasn't why the match didn't work it just sometimes these three-way matches they just like you said it lacks cohesion and uh you know io shirai has been good Mercedes Martinez has been good her whole career. Um, you know, Tony Storm I like, but this just didn't work. It was uh, uh, easily the worst match on the show. And, yeah, I don't even think it was very good. It was, yeah, just just a forgettable match, a bad night. And all three of these women have better days in front of them. So I'm going to actually go to the beginning now of the show because we yeah. can talk about both of the Dusty Rhodes classics. So we start with the women's Dusty Rhodes tag team classic here. Dakota Kai, uh, Raquel Gonzalez versus Ember Moon and Shotzi Blackheart. Joe, I fucking love this match. How good was this? Oh, the floor is yours. Then. I hope you liked it. Did you like it as well? Uh, Why don't we Why don't we uh, hold the tension and see? Okay, all right, we'll see. I will, we'll see I will, I well, I will put – so 17 minutes this match went. Uh, I would have yeah. never in a million years thought if you put 17 minutes next to Dakota Kai, Raquel Gonzalez, Ember Moon, and Shotzi Blackheart that it would be like an exciting – Back and forth, well worked, no blown spots, a bunch of really cool spots, like really good tag team work, like really good cohesion. Like this, I I, I was stunned. It's probably one of those matches that maybe if I went back and rewatched it, it wouldn't really reach as you know that those same highs. 
you know, knowing, you know, going in thinking, hey, this match is good. Let me see how good it was versus going in and going, oh, geez, man, Ember Moon's just, you know, she can't do anything anymore. She fucks up everything. Shotzi Blackheart's really prone to fucking a bunch of stuff up. Raquel Gonzalez is green as hell and Dakota Kai, you know, that's a lot of work for Dakota Kai to kind of carry everybody else and keep everything together. But I thought everybody played their role perfectly. I thought Dakota Kai is kind of the, uh, you know, the, the, the one thing I will say is they did kind of flip and they, they, they've done this a lot with Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez for some reason where they flipped the script a little bit where like, you know, Dakota Kai will get beaten down a bunch and then she does the hot tag to Raquel Gonzalez who comes in and clears house. It's just kind of weird that, you know, obviously given, you know, that they want Dakota Kai and Raquel to be the, the heels or whatever. But again, like I think it worked out well and it's a way to kind of let Dakota Kai, who's really, really good at selling and really good at selling, you know, attacks or whatever, let her do the bulk of the match and Raquel Gonzalez has, just has to go in there and be menacing and do her few little spots or whatnot. So I think it works in the in the, in the way that the tag team is kind of structured. So I, I didn't really have a huge issue with that. But uh, either way, like I thought, you know, Dakota was selling pretty well. I thought Ember and Shotzi were really good here. I mean, they were taking a bunch of risks and a bunch of high spots, and 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 they they always do that. They're all they're two people that will always take huge risks. The problem though is like very often they fuck everything up, or they they're in the wrong spot, or stuff doesn't look right, or it just looks weird, or one of them gets hurt, or something like that. They're just very prone to that. Here they like everything that they did worked. Everything Dakota did, I thought worked, and I thought Raquel. Uh, I, I really like her style, and I think it's it, it, it works well. But uh, yeah, I was just I was stunned when this match was over, how good this was and how just 17 minutes of action and kind of classic tag team wrestling in here. So uh, kudos to them for sure. I I definitely went in with very low expectations and came away just blown away by how good this was. Yeah, I liked it. I thought it was a great match. Um, I do have some minor disagreements. I don't think it was particularly well worked. I actually thought it was uh, a little sloppy, but I didn't care because this was just a high energy High spot fest, go, go, go opener. It had terrible psychology. I thought it was sloppy. But in terms of matches where you're just doing moves and doing stuff, I think there's a place for that. And the place for that is like the opener on a takeover. is the perfect place for just doing moves and doing stuff. And not worrying about the story you're telling. Not worrying about blowing a spot here or there. And uh, listen, if it's the main event of a Wrestle Kingdom, maybe you don't want that kind of match. If it's, you know, uh, you know, you can give other examples. But in this spot, I don't mind that. And uh, it had good drama. It had great energy. And it had great action, even if it was just a doing stuff match. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, it, it was an easy notebook match for me. I thought four out of these five matches were easy notebook matches. Uh, Well over four stars in the case of the rest of them. And I think I went uh, four flats on this one. I did the old four plus. Oh, the Larry. Yeah, classic Larry style there. uh... Couldn't commit to the the full quarter star to give it the four and a quarter. So I gave it the old four plus, uh, you know, because I didn't think it was the cleanest work. But, yeah, obviously it was an awesome exhibition of doing stuff. Yeah, I went four flat as well. So it was a bit again, like I think a lot of it is, like I said, the expectations. I came in thinking, oh, this is going to be a disaster. Oh, yeah. And I hope Dakota yeah. can kind of keep this thing together. And it ended up being like, I thought everybody played their role pretty well. And, and, and yeah, it was, there were, like you said, there were spots that were a little sloppy and a little weird. But like, I, I, to me, I sold it as like, these guys, they're just out here just trying to win this match. Like, they just want so badly to win this fucking tag team tournament that they're going to go out there and kill themselves. And yeah, I was able to kind of present that in a way that worked. Uh, it, it made sense. So, yeah, great, great uh, uh, on that one. And uh, let me just – I'll jump ahead of the, the men's one, and then we'll do uh, Gargano well, and Kushida quick here. Too, we, real quick, though, we have to be fair. We beat up Ender, Ember Moon pretty badly in the preview. She was pretty good here. She was really good here, yeah. So I'll give credit. So we got to be fair. She hit a really good O-face. What does she call it? The uh, not the O-face anymore, for sure. Uh, I forget what it's called now. But... I think it's the Eclipse. <laughs> I believe it's the Eclipse. Yeah, it is no longer Some the kind of... O-face. I can't... Believe it or not, Vic Joseph doesn't have to say, oh, the O-face. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's not the O-face, but I I, <laughs> I wish I it was. I, mean, I don't ever remember what it's called Beth anymore. Phoenix screaming, the O-face. <laughs> something to do with full moons or something. I don't fucking know. It's the... I think it's the Eclipse. But um, she hit that clean. That's always a hold your breath kind of move. Which is very dependent on the person taking it being yeah, in the yeah, right yeah. place. Mm-hmm. But she hit it clean, and I thought she looked pretty good. She she still doesn't look like she's all the way back from that injury, and that's a tough injury to come back from. But I wanted to give her credit because we beat her up pretty good in the preview, and she absolutely held up. You know her twenty five percent of this. And as for Dakota Kai, do you think it's controversial if I said she's one of the five best women's wrestlers no. in the United States? No, not at all. 
Because I, I think she's I believe tremendous. that. Yeah, no, she's she's great I, at selling, I, great at offense, great at, at, at yeah, at, at every aspect of it. I think right now, if I had to pick five, I'd pick Dakota Kai, Serena Deeb, Thunder Rosa, Sasha Banks, and then my fifth spot would go to either take your pick. It's Bailey, Io Shirai, Asuka, probably one of those three. I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. Um. I don't think Rhea Ripley is quite at that level. I, I agree. Yeah, want, I like Rhea, but yeah, no. Th- but those those people you there, mentioned, I, those people you mentioned are, are, are head and shoulders above her right now. They're they're better than Rhea, I think. I wouldn't be like I wouldn't argue with you if you wanted to throw her in the mix, but I, I think that those three are better than her. I can't sit here and tell you that Rhea Ripley is a better worker than Asuka right now. I can't do that. No. But one of those three or four, or maybe I'm missing somebody, would be in contention for my five spot. But for me personally, those four would be locked in based on what how they're working right now. Dakota Kai, who I think is vastly underrated. Sasha Banks, who everyone in the world would have in their top five. Um, Thunder Rosa, who I think is getting her due right now. And I really believe Serena Deeb right now belongs in the top five, if I was going to do a top five. so. But my question to you was, do you think Dakota Kai would be controversial? And you say no, no. I think she's tremendous. I think she's been tremendous for a while, and she's getting she's getting better. I mean, this is this is someone in 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 any other universe. This Dakota Kai Raquel Gonzalez thing would be on the main roster and be one one of the top teams. And and I hope they keep them together because I love the team. I love the dynamic of Dakota Kai being the you know the the small shithead of the team and Raquel Gonzalez being the muscle. Like it just works perfectly. Uh, And I'm so certain that they're gonna as quickly as humanly possible try to break them apart and 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 and, you know separate them. But they should really get this thing going as long as they could. I mean, this this could be like an iconic, like a long term you know tag team for 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 you know the WWE women, whether NXT or or main roster. But no, I I think she's tremendous. So not controversial to me at all. Kai could do it all. I mean, oh yeah, she's obviously a a great heel, great sympathetic. The idea that she (laughs) she's another one in the long lines of like. This company right now is so bad at baby faces that like Bailey, Dakota Kai, Sami Zayn, all these people that are just like the most baby face. I mean, Dakota Kai is the biggest baby face in the fucking universe back in like her shimmer days and and stuff like that. You know when I'd go and see, but like she's it's one of those other ones too that it's like oh she's just a great pro wrestler. Like I always used to think oh man there's like not a better baby face than her. But same thing with Bailey and same thing with with Sami Zayn. They're just tremendous pro wrestlers. And great pro wrestlers yeah. can do both, you know? Yeah. So it's, you're thinking, man, where was this her whole life? Or, or Pac is a great example as well, a guy that nobody in the universe would have thought would have been as good of a heel as, as he was. Or Finn Balor, the aforementioned Finn Balor back in his Prince Devitt days. People were like, holy shit, who knew this guy had it in him? It's just like, well, great pro wrestlers can do both because they're great, you know? And then she's tremendous. So, yeah, she's an incredible baby face and an incredible heel as, as well. So. And Deeb, I didn't know where this came from, but, I mean... Every match is better than the next. I don't know if you saw Dynamite yet. I did not, but I've heard really, really good things about it, so I am going to check that out for sure. Oh, my God. She was she was otherworldly in that match against Riho. And I don't normally like – I'm not normally into Riho, but Riho was very good too. Riho was very good in the match, and Serena Deeb worked circles around her. She was so – she was just great. I, I mean, she's better and better every time out. I, I don't know where this has come from because I thought she was a nice little wrestler for her entire career. And she comes to AEW, and she's just having these performances of a lifetime every time out. So, you know, that's why I would put her in my top five right now. Do I think, like, overall she's, like, a better wrestler than Bailey or Io Shirai? No. Do I think she's doing better work right now? Yes. So, um, yeah, I, I, you, yeah, I know you're going to probably watch it. But, um, yeah, don't, like, pay attention to that match, too. Yeah, like, fuck yeah, around yeah, on yeah. Your phone. No, like, that's I've, not a fuck around on your phone I've heard match. really good things. Yeah, I can't wait to, to yeah. check it out. So. Um, all right, let's move on to the. Uh, well, I'm going to do the men's Dusty Roads just so we can do both of them at the same time. So the men's Dusty Roads Classic, uh, MSK, Nash Carter, and Wesley, who I will definitely call <laughs> Savior and Wentz for at least another six or seven months, uh, defeated your boys, the grizzled young veterans, James Drake and Zach Gibson. We got the promo, we got the heat. These guys were fucking Mc- <laughs> Vince McMahon in 1998, just getting this ungodly heat, just booze all over the the Capital Wrestling Center when when Zach Gibson, which might actually be honest though, that 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 dude that dude does get some crazy heat he, he does uh, I, I i i don't know i i don't know if maybe on this level but i, I think he could probably well, get pretty in front close of, so. <laughs> in front of crowds that in front of crowds that know who he is he does he does yeah so i was gonna say it's unrealistic but but eh, for him maybe not but uh i don't know if a traditional nxt crowd would give him that kind of heat but you put him in you know in in, in a in a you know a, a crowd in in england somewhere he's gonna get this he gets that kind of heat see i think i i, I do think in an american crowd he would it wouldn't at the beginning 
but he would just keep because the the key to his promos are that like he goes an extra like three minutes. Yes, he's yelling at you the whole time, and then you're like, "All right, the, fuck this shit bag, get him out of here." And then he goes, "And furthermore," and you're like, "Oh, dude, fuck this guy! <laughs> like, this guy's got to shut up! Like, I'm done with this guy." So he would absolutely this routine would absolutely get over in front of NXT crowds eventually, for sure. Um, you know, I saw a great tweet by a rando, and I don't remember who it was, but it was just some rando anyway, and it really got me thinking. The <laughs> the tweet was like, "Grizzled young veterans are what people think FTR is." Yes. And I thought about yes. it and I was like, that's a great tweet. Yes, man. Because these guys are great at that style of wrestling, cutting off the ring and, and you know, because that's what this was. It was a perfect oh mix my God. of style. This is, this is an all-time performance by the Grizzled Young Veterans. This, I, as great as MSK was in bouncing all around the ring and doing all their crazy high spots and making sure they were in the right spots and making sure they didn't fuck anything up, it needed a team like the Grizzled Young Veterans to, to, to be in there, be those bases, be the assholes to cut them off, make the, the, you know, the hot tag to Wesley that much more impactful. I mean, this, this match in front of a crowd, I'm not joking, Joe. I may have gone five in front of a full crowd. Uh, oh, well, I don't, I'm right with you. It was that phenomenal. hot tag to Wesley, can you imagine in front of the Barclay Center? After the mm-hmm. grizzly young veterans get the crowd all whipped into shape by talking shit, cutting the ring off on Nash Carter, Nash Carter finally, after 11 minutes of, of really good work by, 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 you know, by the, the grizzly young veterans cutting the ring off and Nash Carter selling, Nash Carter hits that, ta- that fucking hot tag to Wesley. The Barclays, the roof would have blown off the Barclays Center, man. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's just fantastic. No, it was great. And MSK, I mean, um, you know, you got to admit when you're wrong. I buried the signing. I didn't bury it, but I said, look, they're just guys. They have been phenomenal oh, yeah. since they've signed. It's just for whatever reason, they, they, they're just one of those acts that are just greatly improved by when they go to the, And that's not always the case. You know, sometimes guys got to hold back or the WWE working style doesn't work out for them or, you know, whatever the case. The, the work of these two dudes is so much better now than it's ever been anywhere else. Yeah, I saw some people push back when you when you put that on Twitter. I dude, I've seen these guys like probably seventy times live. You know what I mean? Like when you actually put in like the amount of times that I've seen these dudes in different places, and you know, and, and over the they years, work here in the woods a lot. Yeah, they were always here, and I watched every company that they went to, and I was at every almost every show of every company they worked at. These dudes were nowhere near this good. They didn't have a team like the Grizzly Young Veterans to work against. And those guys are yeah. tremendous. They, have, they haven't had the base. They haven't had the, and, and they're just, they're, I don't know who reined them in. I don't know who's kind of working with them. But there's just something about them that just feels different in, in, in NXT. Maybe it's the stakes. Maybe it's the, you know, the production. I don't know what it is. But the, the work is smoother. They would have never, ever in a million years done this spot where, where Nash Carter is, is getting beaten down and beaten down and beaten down and beaten down and tags into Wesley and then gets that hot tag. Like what they would have done is like, you know, in two minutes, Wesley would have came in, done a bunch of his shit. Uh, Wentz would have came in, did a bunch of his shit. They would have just, they wouldn't have done that. They would have just been trading tags and doing a bunch of shit or not tagging or whatever. They would have, they, I've never seen them work this style of match where, where, you know, this kind of Southern style, you know, rock and roll express era, you know, t- type of match or whatever, obviously rock and roll express on, on steroids or, or cocaine or whatever. Spots. Yeah. With, with the, the modern, modern spots. spots. Yeah. But that's what it was it, at its core. It was just an old school Southern wrestling. Yeah. And that's why, like when you said that, that FTR thinks, you know, Grizzly Young Veterans are what people think the F- FTR is because, yeah, they, they were just your classic shitbag Southern heel team that got the heat coming in and are just going to slow down these young whippersnappers. And, 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 yeah, I don't think that MSK would have done this style of match on the Indies, not only because there isn't a Grizzly Young Veterans on the Indies, but also I think they would have, you know, had 10 minutes and just wanted to kind of do their shit. They wouldn't have had 20 minutes to do this kind of really well structured southern style tag match and I'm and, and and yeah so there's a benefit already and and I I'm, I'm with you I think this work is has really reeled them in and, and NXT has done a great job with them and I'm excited. The structure is definitely number one. You're dead on about that. But for whatever reason their work is just cleaner because these guys were sloppy on the indies. Look, we watched them in impact for a year. And like okay, you're right. A lot of people pushed back on me and I didn't engage because I didn't just didn't feel like it. But what I, you know, I typed out a few replies and then <laughs> a little drafts, a few drafts but, in there. <laughs> but I didn't want to get into it because I don't want to start pissing in people's cornflakes when these guys have the match of their life. There's a time and a place to argue about stuff like that. Why pick on these guys when I just loved what they did? You know what I mean? So I didn't do it. But I will pose the question to you. If they were always this good, somebody name another match they've ever had that was this good then. 
Yeah, the only other one, I will give you one. The one they had, uh, it was uh, them and Will uh, Osprey versus fuck. It was at a, uh, it was at a Warrior Wrestling show. Let me, let me, let me punch up the exact match yeah. just to let people know. That is the only one that I saw that I said, oh wow, those guys are great. But I'll be honest. It was a match featuring Will Ospreay, so it was like, well, I mean, well, okay, unless you were one of the 500 people at that Warrior Wrestling show, right, right, okay. Right. I don't want to hear it because these guys were in Impact for a year and didn't have a match that sniffed this quality. Yeah, so it was Amazing Red, Rocky Romero, and Will Ospreay versus Desmond Xavier, Trey Miguel, and Zachary Wentz. Yeah, that was the one that I remember. All right, they're opposite Will Ospreay, Rocky Romero, <laughs> and, and Amazing, amazing Red, Red. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is like, okay, we know now we put these guys opposite guys like that or grizzled young vets, and this is the kind of output you're going to get. You put them in impact with no structure. You put them on some game changer show where they're just doing flippy doos around the ally cat. And, you know, it's a huge difference in structure and everything. It has just worked. Now, I don't think that these guys are, you know, fly into the main event of WrestleMania. Um, I don't know which guy is which, but, you know, I think <laughs> Wesley is, 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 is Xavier. Nash Wesley. Carter is Zachary Wentz. Okay, Nash Carter, I think, and I don't mean this as an insult. I think he's just a guy in terms of, but he's doing great work. But I, ultimately, I don't think he has a ton of charisma. Wes Lee, there might be something there, but this is WWE. If Ricochet can't get ahead, this guy can't. No, no because way. this guy's like, he's like half the height and like you know a hundred pounds lighter than than Ricochet is. So yeah, if he and, can't... and he doesn't even have half the charisma of Ricochet. No. Although, so it's like. That's the bar. Like if Ricochet or Alistair Black can't get anywhere, <laughs> then I don't Black. think. I, love how that I don't think can't Wes Lee. Anything. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't think Wes Lee is. Get, but but they're doing great work, and they've blown me away in every match they've had, and they've proved me wrong. And uh, you know, I have to say it because you know I questioned the signing, and it has turned out to be correct. That it was a good move. And they also rushed them right to TV. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't even they give them any seasoning. They didn't spend any time in hip toss class or they didn't have to know where the hard cam was. They figured it out right away. So, and let me say about grizzled young vets, you got to give these two a lot of credit Absolutely. because these are two guys who on their own, probably, you know, they were really going anywhere with their career. They come together with this team, right? James Drake was called the other James Drake for like his entire career until, you know, uh, a nondescript guy until the other James Drake changed his name. He was just known as the other James Drake uh, Gibson, nice wrestler, but you know, it wasn't until these guys came together and this is really where their careers took off. They've kept their nose clean, not a hint of any trouble with them with speaking out when like every other guy from, uh, from, 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 uh, from their part of the world uh, went down with this thing. Uh, these guys are squeaky clean, they escape all that. Watch, there's probably some accusation out there. Yeah, now. right I'm now, at the time we're but done recording this. So, but as of this recording, they have stayed speaking clean. So anything could change yeah. in a day in British wrestling, especially if uh, anybody related to progress. Every single day, apparently, gets canceled and recanceled. So, um... To the best of my knowledge. <laughs> right, there we go. Yes. I'll put it that way. As of and... Thursday, February 19th, we have not, uh, we don't know of anything, so. They form this team. They get over. Now they have moved to the United States, so they're going to be a fixture for NXT. And it's just a nice story, you know, because and they and they deserve it because uh, they've been a good team and they've been doing good work for a long time. Uh, and then we'll go to uh, the final match on uh, TakeOver. Nice, clean uh, uh, show as well with only the five matches. Uh, North American Championship, uh, Johnny Gargano defeating Kushida to retain his title. Uh, so the build-up to this, as I mentioned in the show last week, has been Gargano faking injuries and avoiding Kushida and trying to get away from him. Uh, Kushida now dresses like Kai uh, from uh, 2014 uh, Wrestle 1. With the, uh, he's got the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the Dago T- T-shirt tucked into the jeans with the taped-up fists and stuff. It's very strange. I don't know. I don't know. I don't exactly know why. I think I missed something of why he did that. Do you know? So you were afraid to say wife beater. I was thinking of the other term, so I just went with the derogatory Italian term. <laughs> so instead of saying wife beater and getting in trouble, the... <laughs> you said Dago, even though your co-host is an Italian American. Yes. So you weren't afraid of offending me. No. You rather no. offend me than offend whoever's going to be offended That's by the true. term. Yeah, I was, like, I, yeah you, you could see it going out in my head. I'm like, man, what the hell else are they called? Because if I said T-shirt, I felt, nobody would know what a T-shirt meant. You know? I felt – I felt you not wanting to say white <laughs> but then i didn't I want to say dago t either so i was like fuck dago t 
And it's also called a guinea tea, which is also derogatory towards Italians. See, I don't even know that one. I, I don't know that one, so I can't, I can't help you with that. Well, guinea is a derogatory term towards Italians. Okay, well, well, there you go. So oh, sorry. Where I grew up, they called them guinea teas. Like, my own Italian family called them guinea teas. I grew up calling those things guinea teas. I didn't hear the term wife beater until I was, like, you know, in high school or whatever, when people would say that. And I've never heard dago tea, but it makes sense because, I mean, let's face it. There's a reason that there's an Italian-American <laughs> stereotype with that garment. I mean, let's be let's be Watch let's be honest. Any episode here. of The Sopranos, and you will uh, be able to very quickly you know, tell. <laughs> Tony dragging ass down the driveway to pick up the paper, wearing a dago tee with a ro- with his robe on. So you know, absolutely, you know, with with grease stains and pizza sauce and and you yeah, know everything it works. else. It's good. But, they're, they're, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of the shirt too. I worn a few in my day. So now that we've been canceled, go ahead and break <laughs> That's down the, fine. Back. the the Italian American Anti Defamation League. Uh, yes. On line one here. Uh, anyway, yeah, Kushida. I don't know. I don't know when he started becoming that guy, but the Eddie Edwards cosplay that he's doing now on NXT. But uh, that's what we got. So anyway, the, the whole angle is Gargano trying to avoid him, avoid him, avoid him. So uh, it started off real lame as as Gargano and his, his his team, the way or whatever, is coming down to the ring, and then Dexter Loomis appears and kidnaps Austin Theory. It's so stupid. And then Gargano turns around and goes, "Where's Austin? No, uh, uh, all right. So uh, Indy Hartwell and, and and Candace, you guys go look for him. Go look for him. You know, I'll, I'll do this on my own or." Whatever. So, like, it's so dumb. So, it's so, we're off to a bad start here because we have a kidnapping from a serial killer to start things off. Yes. But, but I also thought to myself, okay, this could be a way just to get rid of the way. Exactly. So, so it was it was the easy. And I'm so glad because I'm so done with the person grabs someone's feet and the referee goes, all right, you, you, you're out of here. And then they go, wow, no, no, no. So I'm glad they found another way. Unfortunately, it was, you know, a kidnapping, an ether related kidnapping, but yes. uh, it is what it is. <laughs> Did you see Austin Theory's exaggerated movements when he got ethered yeah, to like yeah, yeah. in the arms and he gets dragged <laughs> away? And but there was there was part of me that during this entire match, like towards the end when I was like, This match rules, didn't you think there was the there was a possibility that Dexter Loomis was gonna come out with a bloody knife in one hand and Austin Theory's severed head in the other? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> And just, and just ruin everything. But uh, they they resisted temptation, and this had a clean finish. Yeah. So then they got all the way out of there. They they got all the bullshit out. Gargano says, well, "I'll just face this guy on my own." And then these dudes just went and had a fucking tremendous Johnny Takeover type match here. They just went for twenty five minutes. It's fucking Kushida and Johnny Gargano without bullshit. So it was just a great for wrestling match. It's just like they could do this. You know, there, there was no reason not to do this, especially without nobody interfering. But it's it's so funny that all the build was all this like. You know, laid on thick heel work and my fake injury and my unit and my, you know, my group and Austin Theory and Indy Hartwell and Kit. And he just sent them all to the back. Austin Theory got abducted and then they just had a 25 minute NXT TakeOver main event style match and it fucking rocked. It was just so good. Kushida just dropping, you know, arm bars off the top rope. Gargano just like classic. I mean, this was, this was Johnny. You know, he must have seen those tweets about uh, the, uh, the voice wrestling match of the year list where, he, you know, prior five years, he's been all over that list and, 2020, Johnny. He wasn't anywhere near there. He must have seen those tweets because he made a he made a case to get on there right away uh, with this match. I mean, this is tremendous. This is not going to be top ten, obviously, match of the year. This is going to get votes though for sure at the end of the year, and it deserves it because this was really, really good work by both guys. This is a guy who once signed on to our message board to complain about <laughs> yes. something. So it's entirely possible he saw our match of the year list. But um, no, this was great, and I, I'm going to have a lot of qualifiers. But I'm going to say what you said about the Dusty Classic match. If this had been a tad shorter and in front of a hot crowd, you're looking at a match of the year contender. And I think it's going to do well in our poll, at least among WWE matches. I don't think this is going to like threaten the top 10 or anything, but this definitely is the kind of match where I think it'll be like one of the five, you know, top five WWE matches potentially, because this was really great. It just was a, a tad too long. And it just goes to show, I mean, Gargano, He's a great wrestler. I mean, the problems with Gargano are never his work. It's always the character work and the melodrama and the -the over-the-top theatrics. That's the problem with Gargano. Mechanically, bell to bell, he's very good. He always has good match layouts, too. They just – his shit – even when he was on the indies, he had – he would often go too long. This isn't even a new thing for him. Like, he would go too long on the indies sometimes – and do too many false finishes and, and, and it, you know, so this has been a thing his whole career, but in terms of just his work, he's great. And we know Kushida's great. And 
you know, they gave us a clean finish too on top of everything else. They didn't even ruin it with, with some bullshit. So, no, this was a great match too. I mean, I, like I said, I had four notebook matches and I thought three of them were borderline match of the year quality. This match, the Dusty Classic men's match, and the main event. Yeah, I went where, four and a half with the uh, Dusty men's. Uh, and then I went, yeah, four, so and a quarter, I went yeah. four and a quarter with it with this match and four with the uh, the opener. So, yeah, just that's a, it's a good ass takeover right there. I mean, that is that is not bad. Yeah. And then with the exception of uh, uh, the, the, the women's triple threat. Yeah, I was four stars at, with, with, with Balor and, and Dunn as well. So, yeah, that's, you know, four notebooks yeah. out of five. Not bad. <laughs> That'll work. Yeah, I went four, four and a half, four and a half, four and a half. Damn. I mean, go. and with a crowd, I may have gone higher. Yeah, and no emotional investment either. Things. Like, you know what I mean? Like, no you, you're not investment. sitting there watching the weekly TV and just salivating it. Oh, my God. I wonder how the way are going to, you know, get, you know, the, the, the revenge on them or whatever. You weren't, yeah, you're just, just that at, at bare bones, great wrestling. So good stuff. The show had to win me over on yeah. top of it, you know, and, and um, now look, th- th- there's, now we have to address this. There is a soulless aspect to this. Mm, mm-hmm. it, it's, and even with all of those drawbacks, this, these matches were still so great that I couldn't deny them. Because watching the matches, I feel nothing. Like, I don't care who wins. You know, with the exception of the Balor stuff, like I said before, I really feel nothing when I watch these matches. But they still were so good that they were able to win me over. And that's, I think that's notable. Uh, so sticking with uh, NXT and, and maybe some new stuff going on in NXT as well, uh, this was uh, first reported by Sean Ross Sapp and the team at Fightful.com. I'm going to read uh, what jo- Josh Nation wrote at uh, F4WOnline.com. Uh, it says, quote here, In December, news emerged that WWE NXT was considering a second show that would focus on those trying to make it to the NXT roster. Fightful reported Wednesday that show is another step closer to being a reality with a tentative title of NXT Evolve with Evolve founder Gabe Sapolsky and Jeremy Borash both heavily involved. Uh, Dave Meltzer confirmed that a pilot has been filmed but couldn't confirm any other details. Uh Fightful reported the show's tapings had a bit more of a fight feel and took place at a warehouse that temporarily used uh, when the performance center was unavailable uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, Joshua Williams was the host with new graphics and even a title belt created with the NXT Evolve branding. So um, some other details in there as well at 4 onlinecom also uh, Fightful.com. It's, it's some, some you know in, in, in additional insights uh, into this. But uh, NXT Evolve, Evolve NXT, it's apparently a thing. So- it's happening, and... Uh, I've, I'm excited. I'm interested. Look, NXT, WWE needed another legitimate developmental brand because that's not what NXT is. No, anymore. it could really use like three or four if you ask me, but another I one think, is, 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 yeah, a, a, a step in the right direction. Yeah. Actually, you know, we should also, we neglected to talk about the angle after the main event. Oh, Adam I'm sorry. Cole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duh. Let's do that real quick. Adam Cole, um, I forgot about it too. He super kicked Balor after undisputed era came down to save him after pete dunn and his boys um uh um uh, lorcan and birch attack balor and then they did the big angle uh cole super kicks balor then he super kicks o'reilly and roderick strong is kind of like doesn't know what side to pick and then of course that led to the angle we talked about last night with the seizure with the alleged seizure um and that actually led to a big bump in nxt's total yeah. viewership mm-hmm. last night so they did over 700,000 viewers. Um, you know, I think they only lost to Dynamite by 40,000 total viewers or something like that. Now, the demo was still atrocious. It was still like a .16, I think. But that was obviously a hot angle coming out of an awesome takeover, which led to like 200,000 more viewers versus the week before. Last week, um, NXT did 558,000 viewers. So they did like 160,000 more viewers. And that's clearly off of the angle. I think there's no question about that. So I wanted to bring that up too because I didn't talk ratings on Thursday TV reviews. But um, I think that's where NXT got their bump off of the strength of that Undisputed Era angle. But uh, yeah, that's kind of a transition to this Evolve topic because NXT is clearly just a third brand, right? I mean, that's what they are. So WWE has needed to do this for a long time. And there was also some talk later that there's going to be another sub NXT. I don't know about brand, but maybe touring loop or something when, you know, the world gets back to normal to go along with this too, because I think they recognize that they need developmental again Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they haven't had that in so long. And they have this warehouse full of wrestlers, but you know, with the evolved branding 
and with Gabe Sapolsky at least having a hand in it, um, you know, and, and also uh, the more serious presentation, the fight feel, those are things that immediately appeal to us. If you just want to give me a brand where it's just people with grudges with one another in matches where, you know, we hate each other or there's stakes involved, that sounds simple and, and, and in, in all of the right ways and something that I can get into especially with we know the level of talent that they have available to them under contract that they can do with something like this. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what the rebooted evolve is going to look like. I'll definitely give that a look. And I definitely have some decent expectations for that. Yeah. I I mean, I'm not, I, I, at, at a baseline without knowing all the other details, knowing the details that we do know, I know that Gabe Sapolsky, who, you know, for many, many years, for 15 plus years, you know, booked wrestling that I enjoyed watching and booked wrestling that I identified with and booked wrestling that made me enjoy and love wrestling again, uh, now has, you know, the ability to develop new talent, something that he was very good at. And and one of his his calling cards, I mean, for years and years and years before he was even in WWE. And, and, you know, we always used to say when we first started this podcast that if Gabe got his eyes on you, that was the next step is that they, you know, WWE and, and many other companies realized that when Gabe sort of thought a guy had talent, he was like, okay, cool. Well, then then we're going to check this guy out and see what he can do with him. So so we have that, a guy who I've enjoyed his booking you know, for, for many, many years, a guy who's tremendous, I think, at, at identifying and finding new talent and putting new talent over. Oh, yeah, and he has access to, like, the world's greatest wrestling roster ever. You know, in terms of like the people that are there and he's got the you know, the ability now to do this thing and not really have to worry about ratings and worry about building to this or building to that or whatever. I mean, we don't know exactly what this is going to be. We don't know where it's going to be, where it's going to appear, what you know, whatever. But my assumption is that it would be a little bit more developmental style, that it is going to be probably online only. That is probably going to be only the network. I'm just saying that that's my assumption. I have no idea. But, you know, if that's all the case, then count me in for sure. Because this is, it, it. like you said, simple stuff with a guy that we've identified with before, that we've trusted his booking before, that we've enjoyed his booking before, and he has access to all the production value that WWE has, and as well as the gigantic fucking roster that they have. Have of, of talented indie wrestlers so i'm in i'm all in on, on, on seeing what this thing does sapolsky's kind of running from it though because when the news broke he sent out a tweet that said uh my name doesn't belong attached to this it's a team effort so he doesn't want i mean people were gonna look it's called evolve <laughs> i mean it's called freaking he, evolve yeah <laughs> does he think people aren't gonna so of course people are gonna associate it with him and of course people are gonna know that he has uh something to do with it so um, you know, he's trying to be a team player, though, and distance himself from being, um, you know, the, the, the... but it, it's not going to work. I mean, people are going to understand and, and, and regard him as the guy uh, kind of leading this thing. But there's not a ton more details. I mean, we just know uh, basically what you just read. So we'll see. I hope it I hope it happens. I mean, we know it's filmed. They haven't hinted that they're going to start it up at any point. But um you know, a stripped down version of developmental with the talent that they have with sort of that Evolve branding and hopefully some connections to what Evolve was. I followed Evolve right to the end. I was one of the few that were there right to the end. Uh, I say the few, even though they drew better in their last year than they ever did in their history, which is something that is going to get lost in history. That Evolve did their best business in their final year of existence when the wrestling intelligentsia had stopped paying attention because they were bored by the idea that it was tied in with WWE, which I totally understand. Yeah, for sure. You don't want to watch, you know, uh, Jesse Kamea and, you know, know, and and whoever else uh, coming in from WWE because, you know, you, you want to watch independent. I get it. But the fact remains, they did their best business in their final year of existence uh, before the pandemic just put the nail in the coffin. But, um, so, yeah, I, I – you know, and they, they just put Evolve 1 on the network. Man, if you want to feel even worse about the modern indie scene, go watch Evolve 1 on the network. I heard, Yeah, I heard game. that Evolve 1 dropped on there, and I, I don't think I want to because I know who's on that card and I know what that card is. And, and I remember loving that card at the time, and I'd be very upset, right, I think, watching it these days. But I think I'm going to do it anyway because it has been many, many years since I, since I watched it. So, Rich, the opening match is Kyle O'Reilly versus Bobby Fish, and – it would be – and it's not – they're not even trying to have like a match to steal the show because it's the opener. And if you remember early Evolve, it was all about like – kind of like how this is described. 
just competition and presented his fights. Mm-hmm. And they went out there in a you know tidy little eleven minute opener, and it was better than any indie match I've seen in the last year and a half. I mean, you know, it, it's just it, it, the the level of wrestler and athlete is just different on that show. You know what I mean? It's like I'm wa- I watched the whole show, and then um, you know it was TJP versus Sawa. Yeah, they brought yeah, yeah. him. And then the main event was uh, oh, it's Richards and uh, Ibushi, right? Davy Richards and oh, Kota Ibushi. Jesus it's Christ! Like, yeah. It's just a different level of wrestler than what yeah. you see on the. And we knew this. Like this isn't. And look, this show was uh, two thousand what uh, nine, I guess. So you want to, uh, or was it two thousand? Uh, two thousand ten, I believe it was early. It was early two thousand ten. I think January twenty ten. This is an eleven year old show. Okay, it's over a decade old, and we knew that you know indie wrestling has never been worse than it is now and how much better that but then you watch it and it like rich however big you think the gap is it's bigger (laughs) like you watch it and you're like these are just great i'm watching major league wrestlers and and a lot of them before they were even as good as they are now you know most of them actually you know so it's like man that show was just an eye-opener in every way uh, isn't uh, the semi main event, if I remember correctly, isn't our, our, our boy? I think he's listening right now. Gran Akuma is in that uh, semi main event, isn't he? Yeah, there's a. Uh, um, it's it's uh, Akuma's. It's uh, Akuma, Brody Lee, and. Was it Icarus? Uh, I think it was Icarus, right? Icarus, I forget. I have yeah. no idea who they were against. It was some Chikara trio, but I forget yeah, who it's, it was. It's, it's Hollow Wicked, Frightmare, and, and Quack. Oh, I oh, think. hell yeah. Nice. Because um, somebody. Somebody. Frightmare was a replacement for that. I can't remember. Um, keep an eye on the chat room because he's he might be in there. <laughs> yeah. um, or you or one of us can just pull it up. But uh, yeah, that was a there was a trios match on that show. That was excellent. The whole show is just a different level of wrestler up and down the card. Like it's just you know it's everything we talk about, but just hammered home even more. And go watch it because the opening like backstage kind of thing is Davy Richards with a kick bag. With oh wheel God, man. here we go. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly how this is probably going to go. Yeah. He's back there with the wheel man, Tony Kazina and O'Reilly, and he's kicking a bag, getting ready for a bushy. And there's like this interview woman who I don't know her name. I, I don't think she lasted very long. I don't know who she is. And she's like wanting an interview. And oh, he's oh, like, he's got no time for that. Right. It is such, it is, the, it is such dumb jock wrestler energy. <laughs> he's like, he's like, what are you doing back here? I'm preparing for a main event against a world class competitor. Right, like th- this one minute of not kicking this bag is going to prevent him from defeating <laughs> yeah. Kota Bushi in this main event. I love it. Yes, that's We're how wrestling work. used to be, and it whirled. It was awesome. We're doing work back here. We're doing work. Who do you think you are? You know, and then Kazina's like, "All right, come on, honey. You know, <laughs> come on, Toots. Toots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Spit out it out. Spit it out, Toots. <laughs> you know, and then they usher her out of the room, and he gets back to his kick bag, and I'm just like, right, you can't miss this- a minute of that kick bag. Yeah, no. I'm like, this is the wrestling I need and want in my life. Like, this this is what I want. You know, no antics. No fucking, it wasn't fucking Gran Akuma presents a fun time <laughs> wrestling zone. No, it was fucking dumb jocks beating each other up for two, for two and a half hours. It was Mercedes Martinez squashing some geek that I'd never heard of. And then doing the post-match interview with Lenny Leonard or whoever it was. And saying, I'm here for competition, and you haven't given me any. I better face someone tougher than this the next time I'm here. That's all I want out of my wrestling, Rich. People kicking each other's asses and then talking shit. So maybe, fingers crossed, this Evolve reboot can be that. Is it too much to ask to just have people fight (laughs) and want to beat each other up and be good at it? And and one find thing, out what that match was, or, uh, uh, so yeah, it, so it was the the three that you mentioned. Uh, it was Hallow Wicked, yeah. Frightmare, and 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 Quackenbush. I don't know who. So you said one of them was replacing somebody. Yeah, on the that I the that quack, I don't know. That I I can't find. The Quack side, Frightmare was a replacement. I don't remember. Rich, it's eleven years ago. Yeah, I don't that's, remember. That's fair. Who he, that's fair. I don't remember who he replaced, but um, he was definitely not. It was it was Quackenbush, Hollow Wicked. And I don't remember who the third, who the partner was supposed to be. And I'm just trying to think of the roster then, because I was following Chikara at that mm-hmm. time. Because, I, but I don't, I don't remember. But, um, but yeah, that yeah, that was an awesome match too. You know, um, 
you know, you had, you had uh, Chuck Taylor win in a roster spot. I think he beat uh, Cheech, maybe? Yeah, I'm looking at the card right now. He beat Cheech. You have Chris Dickinson versus Johnny Gargano. Which is like Baby Chris Dickinson. Yeah, a little baby. Little, little baby. John, kid, little, like, John, John Gargano, he's like fucking 19 then, right? He's a little baby then, too. Yeah, it, and uh, uh, Dickinson is just like, before he was jacked, you know? But he still had the energy. He had the dumb jock energy. Yeah. Like, you know... Because they did this thing where they had all the wrestlers say, why do we fight? And then they give the reason, you know? It's just it's such dumb jock shit. And Dickens is like, why do I fight? Because it's my life! You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking phenomenal shit. You know? It's, 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 I miss it. Rich, I miss it. I know. God. You know? I miss it. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, so. I I, I doubt this of re- reboot will be, um, you know, uh, exactly the way it was but yeah well, well one thing that i do like about it you know at least from what we heard in in in, in the reports and and things that got me it has me at least a little excited about it is that the idea is that okay these people are here because they're trying to get to nxt and to me that is always i mean gay uh, speaking just not just gay but obviously gabe was always excelled and, and always attempted to book to something the original Evolve idea was we're going to do wins and losses and rankings and all that sort of stuff. And it became impossibly hard to do that on the indie level because guys show up, guys don't come back. You know, Davey Richards leaves. You know, Brian Danielson gets signed. Like, it's very hard to do it on the indies. It's, it, it's incredibly difficult to do a real, true wins and losses, ranking, all that sort of stuff. But but he always kind of held that idea. And ROH, there was always kind of the hierarchies that guys would kind of move up and move down or whatever. And and it's one thing that NXT really excelled at in the early days is that when, when guys won titles, Titles, it was like, man, they're one step closer to being on the main roster. And then a lot of times those guys would, you know, lose that main title and then they were done. And then that they'd move up to the roster and the next, you know, group of guys would come in and then those guys would win titles and then they would move out. And like, that's the way it was. And, 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 and st- having built in stakes of, hey, when you, you know, you get to the top or you beat, you know, beat this guy or you win this title or whatever. And now you will go to NXT or like, that's all. I think it booking is always done better when it's not just a constant, just like, and, and that's what current NXT, unfortunately, is, is 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 dealing with now. Is it's like you know Gargano beat Kushida. Okay, cool. You know whatever he retains his title. Nothing moves. You know nothing happens with those guys. They're just right where they were well, before. NXT, you, NXT used to be that. Way. Yeah, exactly. Like every match had like oh man, like they're gonna move up the ladder now, or they're gonna move up to the main roster, or oh man, they might get cut now. You know, like you always every match had that feel and had that sort of weight to it. And uh, yeah, I, I, at least from what we're hearing from this evolve thing, maybe maybe that's you know at least. Having wrestling with that that has an an end or some stakes or some sort of thing that people are trying to attain, other than just you know fake titles, is is, is always done better and always done you, you know more effectively. So hopefully, yeah. All right, we are going to uh, move away from. Uh, well, I guess. <laughs> do you want to talk Elimination Chamber, Joe? You want a preview? We should run through the card. World Wrestling Entertainment's Elimination Chamber 2021 streaming live on the WWE Network. That's the is this the last one? This is it, right? What do you mean? Because the fast lane uh, is on uh, the Peacock, right? Fast lane's the test run. You can... Yeah, so here we go. Bit of do to the WWE Network with uh, the Elimination Chamber this weekend. So, yep. um, you have the Elimination Chamber match, Joe, for the WWE Championship: Drew McIntyre, AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Randy Orton, Sheamus, and Kofi Kingston. They're trying to recapture. No, that was like an organic thing. <laughs> the Kofi Mania, Kofi. yeah, yeah. Two years ago. And they're trying to like recapture this lightning in a bottle. First of all, there's no fans. That's number one. The whole basis of that was the fans that pushed that over the top. You don't have that. So it's not going to work. Number two, it wouldn't have worked anyway. You can't do the same thing with the same guy (laughs) and have it be non-organic. It's just that worked because the fans felt like they finally had control and they got behind a guy and And they were like, wow, the company's listening. You can't force that hand. So it got the Miz out of the match, which never made sense to begin with because he has the briefcase. But, um, yeah, it's just, you know, no original ideas. You know, let's just go back to that. They're out of them. Yeah, let's go back to this old thing that we did two years ago. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, The Raw Women's Championship, as uh, listed right now, which I don't believe is actually the match anymore, Asuka versus Lacey Evans. Uh, I don't believe Lacey will be facing Asuka for the Raw Women's title on, a, on That'd Sunday. That'd be a poor idea. That would be a, a very, very bad idea. And and I'm very, I'm, I'm slightly interested now in in where they go uh, with this Lacey Evans Rick 
Charlotte storyline. Because to me, the, the clear idea was that Lacey beats Asuka here. Charlotte beats Lacey at WrestleMania. Tells her father to stop fucking Lacey Evans or whatever the hell. And, like, everyone's good and everyone goes back to their normal thing or whatever. But now everything kind of changes. And I guess I guess Asuka keeps the title for a little bit longer. I don't know who they put in here. I have no idea. We don't know right now as of this recording what the hell they're doing well, with this match. So Obviously, Rick gave her his baby batter and knocked her up, right? I mean, right, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So... Um, is his baby batter going to be potent at this age? I mean, guys like eighty it's, years old. It'd be tough. Yeah, I don't know. It it, it would. Uh, it certainly it would take a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, tries. But I mean, Ric Flair's the guy that can, can you know. Listen, he's got work rate. Nobody I was going to say he can, he can go twenty you know? times if you need him to. So that that's, that's all right. night long, Space Mountain. You know, so yeah, absolutely. But the idea is that he got her pregnant, correct? Yes, even correct. though her husband has been in a WWE storyline less than eighteen months ago. <laughs> right. Correct. Yes. But but the idea is that now he knocked her up. Like they're they're leaning into this the way they didn't lean into the seizure. If I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, right? You're right. Okay. Fantastic. There I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I'm fine with that. If you want to say Ric Flair got her pregnant, <laughs> United States Championship. Uh, Bobby Lashley defending in a triple threat match between Keith Lee uh, and Matt Riddle. Did you uh, did you watch the build to this on uh, World Wrestling Entertainment's Monday Night Raw a few weeks ago? Rich, I never miss an addition. <laughs> I, I knew you didn't. So for people that don't know, so Keith Lee and Matt Riddle, or Riddle, sorry, Riddle, uh, had a match where they uh, were fighting for the chance to face Bobby Lashley at uh, WWE Elimination Chamber 2021. Uh, so they have their match. They go back and forth, yada, yada, yada. Bobby Lashley comes out, beats both their asses, and they both get the title shot. So <laughs> here we are. Well, you know, Bobby Lashley has been booked the most protected like man the most protected man in this entire company why is he not in any of these championship matches well what i was gonna say was I, don't even have a problem. I was gonna say i don't even have a problem with that but they're not gonna go anywhere with it that's the thing right like i like what they're doing with bobby lashley yes I think that's bobby, how they push people they have them win yeah, all their matches it's a good that's way called to do the it. fucking push yeah, it's a good way to do it. it i i agree it is a fantastic way to push somebody rich i enjoy when people are pushed believe it or not i like that um, but we all know this isn't going to go anywhere. I mean, the guy never fucking loses, but I, maybe they'll surprise me. But do you really envision Bobby Lashley mm. versus Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania for the? I don't. I, I don't. I don't either. Yeah, I don't. Uh, so we'll see. That. Uh, so now we have a Lee uh, and Riddle. I mean, Riddle we know is just the guy. I mean, that's just... <laughs> yeah, oh, that's done. Yeah, that's all. But Lee is just the guy, right? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, like even more reports are that Vince just hates him every single time he sees him now too. So it's yeah, it's perfect. It's well, going exactly Vince, the way we wanted it to to go. We knew so. Vince hated him when he started wearing basketball shorts and a full shirt yeah, to the yeah, ring. Yeah, yeah. He clearly didn't thought the man had a disgusting physique. I mean, that was obvious from the start. Um, Keith Lee's promos are fucking weird. Is anybody going to talk about this? Just his cadence and the way he talks. Do you even notice that or no? Uh, a little bit, yeah. They're 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 definitely strange. <laughs> they're definitely like a little he's like odd. A philosopher yeah. or something. He's like, well, Riddle, I would have to say that if we take on each other in a contest tonight, he he almost talks like Gene Simmons in a way. Like he has this weird cadence about him where it's creepy. I never noticed him cutting promos like that. But to be honest, I don't know how many promos I heard him cut on the Indies. He wasn't exactly going out there with a mic for twenty minutes. You know, on Evolve shows. So was he always cutting these weird promos? So I think he always had that sort of like a little bit of that cadence. Because like the bask in the – like there was kind of that, that yeah. pause when he would do the bask. And I think then somewhere along the line he decided that all of his promos needed to be in the cadence that the bask in my glory part of his promo was. And and now, yeah, he just takes like – says a few words with like very long-winded pauses in between them. And, and yeah, it's, it's, it's odd for sure. It's but. a very weird cadence. Anyway, let's move on. Well, so Elimination Chamber match for uh, a chance at the Universal Championship. Later in the same night, Roman Reigns is going to face the winner of this Elimination Chamber. Somebody's doing double duty here. Uh, Jey Uso, Kevin Owens, King Corbin, Sami Zayn, Cesaro, and Daniel Bryan. I mean, that is, in another universe, that is an awesome match that I am very much looking forward to. Uh, but it's in this universe, and I couldn't possibly care less about it. So, Yeah, I mean, these two matches will probably be fun. This one has a chance to be real good, but... It's an investment issue. They'll have to win me over the way NXT won me over. Because I don't care and I'm not invested. How could you be? And then, uh, you know, Reigns takes on the mystery opponent yeah. after he's already been weakened in the match. And beats his ass which, and wins again, yeah. It's been the Reigns story. Like, he's like, he's an insecure guy who's pretending he's super secure. Like, that's his character. Yeah. Like, he's, 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 he's exuding confidence when in reality, 
he's very um uh what's the word i'm looking for um unconfidence not a word i can't yeah yeah he, he definitely lacks yeah he, he lacks he's fragile yeah he's fragile he lacks confidence he's mentally not up to you know but but he has the persona and the idea oh no i i'm, I'm running everything i know everything but yeah he's slowly ha- you know he has to get his buddies to kind of help him out he's got to get Heyman to help him out he's got to get management to help him out so yeah that's he's he's yeah. a coward because he's the WWE heel so he's got to be a coward while also right. being the fuck out of everybody <laughs> so that's it started off with such great hope the heel turn and and to, to you know to be fair well you know now looking at it you know smackdown did have momentum doesn't really anymore so well edge was on it last week that's why oh uh, yeah edge <laughs> guy is so fucking terrible for ratings it is unbelievable that smackdown is on like a two months straight of like consistently decent ratings edge appears on that show for you know, a few minutes and they just tank immediately. That dude is is they I, they have kind of. I mean, they pumped the bricks a little bit on the Edge thing. Remember, he was on every show. Every, have, everybody yeah. was talking about Edge. Where's Edge? Oh, my Edge is doing this. Edge is doing that. They have pumped the brakes a little bit the last few weeks. I mean, in an age where these kind of things mattered, and they were worried about tickets and pay per view buys, they would just totally reverse course on Edge. Let's be honest. I like Edge, but that's how it would have went down. Now it doesn't matter though. It doesn't make a fucking difference. So Vince could just treat this like his. A call back to Cardona and Myers. Vince could treat this like his fig fed now. It doesn't matter. He can do whatever he wants and, you know, tell whatever stories are in his 77-year-old brain, and it doesn't make a difference. But if this were the old days, they would have – and you're right. They have kind of – they've pumped the brakes on edge, but they haven't waved the white flag. He's still going to be in the main event. Oh, sure, sure, sure. You know what I mean? But in the old days, they might be rethinking or at least maybe retooling the story or whatever, but – yeah, so Roman Reigns will take on a weakened opponent. Watch it be Kevin Owens again. <laughs> Watch it be Kevin Owens again. But um, I, who else would it be? It's I mean, it's going to be, yeah, the rest guy. of the guys, at least, I mean, Daniel, you wouldn't do you wouldn't do it with Daniel Bryan because I think maybe you're building that up at least for, for another month or something. Or, or maybe, uh, you know, a, actually, you know what, that now. actually works. He's... Actually, well, yeah, I guess you're right. He is kind of a heel now, yeah. Not a heel. No, but he's a geek now. He's a geek. He's like, Brian never wins. He's just a guy on the roster who loses a lot. Yeah. Like, I don't but that, know that usually is the, the precursor to a push, though. So, Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he wins this, loses in the Elimination Chamber, or l- loses in the uh, the match with Roman, and then says, oh, you need another shot because, you know, you, you beat me when I was already broken down. But you're right. It's probably just going to be Kevin Owens, and then, you know, we'll figure out Brian- next month. Brian would work as a filler opponent on this show, I guess, or or to get them through fast lane as sure, well. Like sure. I see what you're saying, I see what you're saying, but he's not he's not gonna be a big player. Oh no no, he's not main eventing WrestleMania with Roman Reigns. That's that yeah, that is no. not happening. So and Cesaro obviously is just a <laughs> job guy, and Zane is a job guy now. And I mean, I don't think they're gonna put Corbin heel heel, and they've done Uso, and that's again heel heel. So yeah, it's probably gonna be Owens again. Probably. All right, that is it for NXT, that is it for WWE, that is it for all that stuff. So let us get to uh, Pro Wrestling Noah. Before we do that, though, I do want to let you know that uh, this episode is also sponsored by Keeps. It's been a while since we've talked to our good friends uh, at Keeps. But uh, as you know, guys, so much of our identity is wrapped in our hair from how it feels after getting a fresh cut. Joe, you know that all so well. Uh, It's perfectly styled before going out. That's why when we get into our 20s and 30s and start noticing the first signs of hair loss, it definitely starts feeling like panic time because, let's face it, nobody is ever ready to go bald. No guy ever wants to be bald. But now, thankfully, there's Keeps, the simple and easy way to keep your hair. Two out of three guys will experience some form of male part- pattern baldness by the time they're 35. Uh, the best way to prevent that hair loss is to do something about it while you still have the hair left. If you're already bald, it's too late. So when you start noticing, that's when you want to do stuff. And uh, the great thing about Keeps is you can get treated at home. You used to have to go to the doctor's office for your hair loss prescription. But now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get hair loss medication delivered right to your home. Uh, they make it easy and deliver your medication every three months. So you can say goodbye to the pharmacy checkout lines and the awkward doctor visits. Uh, keep, uh, keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. Uh, you may have tried them before. You may know the names, but you have never tried them for this price. Uh, and as we said, uh, prevention is key. Keeps treatments typically take between four and six months to see results, so it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. Uh, and you can find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any other competitors, and more than 100,000 men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention medications. Uh, Keeps treatments start at just $10 per month, plus for limited time only, you can get your first month free. You're going to do that 
by going to keeps.com slash VOW. That's going to get you that first month for free. Again, keeps.com slash VOW. I'll spell it out for you. K E E P S dot com keeps.com slash VOW to get your first month of keeps treatment for free. All right. Noah destination. We have charted the, the boats and we're at the destination 2021 back to Budokan hall, right to the main event. Keiji Muto defeating Goshi Ozaki, 29 minutes and 32 seconds to become the GHC heavyweight champion. Keiji Muto, 58 years old, is your GHC heavyweight champion. Joe, what do you think of that? What did you think of the match? Um, well, look, it's not what I would have done. We talked about it last week. Uh, but I suspected it's what they were going to do because it's the scenario we laid out that you know, pretty much everyone had figured out at that point. Yeah. Oh, months ago, we, we when when it was initially booked and, and decided, we were like, ah, fuck. And then there were times where maybe we relented a little bit, or maybe I thought, ah, maybe they're not going to do it, or ah, what? And then when it got closer, it's like, yeah, this is probably what they're going to do, and and they did it. So. And when you put the puzzle pieces together, I mean, you know, he beat Kiyomiya in a match that I really liked. Um, so it all sets up Kiyomiya not only getting his win back, but winning the title when he gets his win back. So we kind of pieced that together and we talked about it last week. So kind of saw it coming. Um, it's not what I would have done. I do think it's a bad look to have him as your champion. Um, I thought the match stunk. Like I, I seen, you know, a lot of people thought it was a great match. A lot of people thought the match was terrible. I didn't see any like in between. So when I went into it, I was like, all right, well, I really liked the Kiyomiya match. And a lot of people didn't like that match. So it's like with Muto, for obvious reasons, it's either really landing with people or you're like, okay, this guy's a broken down fucking guy with no knees. This fucking stinks. And in this particular match, that's the side I fell on. I thought it was dreadfully boring. I didn't think this was interesting at all. I thought Muto was bad in the match. I mean, I thought he looked even worse than usual. Look, he never looks spry or good anymore. It's not like he looked great physically against Kiyomiya. But I thought that match told a great story, and I thought his work was acceptable. And when you combine that with his charisma, I thought that that match worked. And I went notebook on that match. Um, I thought it was absurd that he won, but I went notebook on that match. Um, This match here, man, it's just a dull, unexciting, just boring. And... Uh, his he wasn't good, and he always has charisma. That's never a problem. But um, it, and it almost felt like I was watching something that was almost a bit absurd because I just don't buy that this fifty eight year old guy who looks like he's sixty eight moves like he's seventy eight is a physical threat to Go Shiozaki, who has been this unbreakable dominant champion. So I had kayfabe problems with it too. Like, I felt like Shiozaki. It, it, it just it, it was. I didn't buy it. I didn't buy that Shiozaki would struggle with this person. Whereas with the Kiyomiya match, I was able to buy it because of the way the match was laid out. And you have a kid who's like twenty three, and okay, I can buy the idea of the veteran master. Um, you know, be you know, schooling the twenty three year old. Right. Yeah. Yeah channeling his old self and school in the 20s. I could buy that. Yeah, you know, he's got a little, the bright lights came on. He's there again against, against a legend. You could totally buy that Kiyomiya is just like overwhelmed by the, the everything that Keiji Muto brings to the table. And, you know, got caught. Physically, he knows he could beat Keiji Muto. In the ring, he knows he could beat him. But he he can't match the aura, the confidence, the swagger, the history. Yeah, yeah all that sort of stuff. Yeah, totally the, the can buy that. Just right. the veteran experience. And I'm going to show this kid a lot. In this case, it's Go Shiozaki, who's supposed to be a dominant champion bringing Noah back to prominence in the prime of his career, who has beaten everybody in the company from Nakajima to, to, uh, to, to Kashi Sagara right down the line. And he's struggling with this guy. I had trouble with that. And his performance wasn't good. And the match was dull. So when you combine all of those things, I thought it was like a two-star match. I mean, it wasn't interesting. And, Maybe if I had watched it live, maybe I would have gotten wrapped up in it more because I didn't know the outcome, but I don't think so because it just wasn't interesting. 
And Muto has such limitations that Go had to work down to his level. And um, as far as the finish, it's not what I would have done. I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think it's going to derail the company. I don't think it was the smart. I don't think it was. I think Kiyomiya should be beating Shiozaki and not Muto. Because I also think getting the rub from beating Muto is extremely overrated. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I am I'm. got to. I have to. Before I get my thoughts on the match, and, and you're talking yeah. about that. Wh- when did we just decide that, like, that is that beating an old decrepit man is, is like great. And okay, that's going to make you a star. Like, and he didn't have a chance. If, if it was that big of a deal, everyone's like, Oh, yeah. well, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for Kiyomiya. Well, he could have beat him f- three months ago. <laughs> like what, what, why, why it has to have the title. Oh, well beating, you know, Keiji Muto for this title that he's never fucking won before. So it's like, he's not a Noah guy. Like you said, it's not like this is a really like died in the world. Like, this isn't all Japan. This isn't New Japan. It's not. It's not, and it's not fucking fifteen years ago. It's not twenty years ago. I don't know what beating, but everybody just assumes that oh, you beat Kijimuto, now you're a star. I, does that yeah, mean well, what that, it does in 2021 that it did in 2001? I, I don't think I so. Think I think that's very overrated. When is Kijimuto all of a sudden some huge star? That's now? what I'm wondering. I don't know. I this missed guy, something apparently. But. This guy couldn't fill Cork and Hall in, right. for Wrestle One. Yeah, Wrestle One fucking failed. This miserably. guy couldn't fill. This guy couldn't fill Cork and Hall. Look it up. He had those matches against Jiro where we were screaming that Jiro should have been beating him. Not only was he beating Jiro in those matches, but they were drawing like a thousand fans. But now all of a sudden, Keiji Muto, I don't think, look, look, nostalgia fans in Japan are going to be into this. Okay. But you're also telling those fans, those nostalgia fans that Keiji Muto is still a bigger star than all of our current fans. So right. why would you pay to see them once Keiji Muto has gone? And I understand he signed a two year contract, but if you think he's working every show, you're nuts. Okay. But I don't think this, this alleged rub that Kiyomiya is going to get from Muto. Muto has been working sporadically in part time for the last decade. and hasn't meant anything. All of a sudden he means something. I don't know. I, yeah, you're not, you're not breaking up the long title reign. You're not breaking up a you know three year IWGP title reign. You're not breaking up a. You're not beating this guy in the G1 when he's won the last two G1s. Or you're you're beating 2021 nearly 60 year old KG Muto. Like I don't know. Does that really? I to me I don't understand. I like I, I just I can't fathom where people have decided that that all of a sudden means something and you're just a guy now. You're just a made man if you beat you know this KG Muto in 2021 for a title that. I, I don't know. I, 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 you can't sell me on that. You just can't. I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm willing to listen to examples you know, of of other sixty year old guys that you know lost to you know young stars, and that young star became a huge star because of that. I mean, I'll, I'll listen to it if you have an example, but I, I don't know. I and don't the have problem any. with the problem with Muto to me, it's it's not even necessarily his age. It's like we talked about with Edge in a vacuum. It's like the problem with Edge isn't his age. It's that. It's a company that hasn't bothered to create a young star in so long, and then it just exemplifies the issue. Remember we talked about that. It's not Muto's age. Nobody ever talks about Minoru Suzuki's age, right? No one ever does because he still has credibility, and you can still buy him as a threat, and he's still a star in all those things. But with Muto, it's his age combined with the fact that he looks even older than his age. And moves around even older than he his can't age. Walk. Yeah, he can't walk. It's embarrassing. And, and that's... it's like, yeah, and it's like, I, I think that, you know, people kind of see through that. And it's kind of like a mockery to have him be the champion of the company because it really is. It, it's just it, it's a uh, it's just not a good look. I no, mean, and... and again, I don't think it's going to be super damaging. I don't think even think it's going to matter, honestly, but it's just not what I would have done. I think it looks better for Kiyomiya. Here, this is what I would have done. Kiyomiya just should have beat Muto the first time, if you want to do this, and then have Kiyomiya win the title from Shiozaki. And and here's the other thing. I'm not I'm also not particularly moved or have any feeling of nostalgia for Muto being the guy to win all three of these titles. I don't give a shit. Because he's 58 and he's washed up. If he would have won all of these three titles when he was still competent, maybe I would have been into that. But I think people just see this as like a gold watch thing. Like we're going to do this just because we're going to do it. But it looked ridiculous him beating this guy. And I understand it was like a fluke with the uh, – it wasn't like he beat him. But, you know, he beat him with the um, 
He did like the Hurricane Rana, the and Hurricane held, Rana, and held the his throat, yeah, and then held the his throat flash down, yeah. pin. Yeah. But it's still, it's like I felt like a prime athlete was working down to the level yes. of an old man. That's how it all came across to me. Yeah, no, I, I'm 100 percent with you. It, it it was ridiculous to me that Go Shiozaki had to it was lasting 30 minutes with this guy and couldn't just put him away in a, in, in a few minutes. And and you're absolutely right about the the age thing. Like we we don't care. Like in the in, in DDT, like you know, Jun Akiyama, you know, had a, had a big. I have not watched the match yet. It's been linked. I think it's free on on on, on YouTube. Like I could buy Jun Akiyama winning a world title because Jun Akiyama is still is still pretty damn good. Like he could still I go. I watched that. Did you yeah. watch it? I have not watched it yet. No. I had no problem with that because do not because again it's he can not walk. strictly yeah he can walk it's, yeah it's not strictly about the age uh-huh. it's the age combined with the fact that you know the guy has had a thousand knee operations and can't really wrestle well anymore he could get by on drama he can get by on telling a story like he did against Kiyomiya but this match just didn't work no this was Goshiozaki working him over for twenty five minutes Keiji Muto throwing a horrendous shining wizard he could he went anywhere near Goshiozaki. <laughs> And then, yeah, just it, it was, yeah, it was it just really it, to me, it, it it was embarrassing for Goshiozaki, who's had a tremendous year, who had to sit here and work at half speed with this guy. You could tell he's sitting there waiting for Mudo to get his breath because he can't go to his next move or the next transition. Keiji can't do anything. They go to the top rope for one high spot, and Keiji fucking can't turn, and he's dropped on his. Well, head okay, like, I'll defend that. The idea there was he teased the moonsault. No, no, no. I'm talking about when Go and Mudo were at the top rope, and and, and Go was trying to do the. Uh, what was he trying oh, to do? Oh, different spot. All right, I'm sorry. I, yeah, no, 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 no. The, the mood salt was clearly like Mudo saying, "Oh, I retired it. Maybe I'll do it." Ah, yeah. uh, no, I can't. I'm not going to do it. No, that I have no problem with that. That's fine. That that's an old guy realizing, ah, fuck, I'm not doing that. That's not going to work for me. Well, uh, that was going to produce some drama because people weren't sure whether he was going to right, try right, it. right, right. But you good know, one spot. thing I wanted to bring up in the match that I immediately thought of when I was watching this match, and 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 for all the different reasons, is Tenru and Okada. That's a match that you have talked about. You wrote about on the website a tremendous write up many many years ago about that match. And for people that did not watch that match, I had very similar vibes here. Even though Tenru was probably way worse than Mudo was at this time in terms of physicality. Not that far off, though. I'm going to be honest, not that far off. Like, But Tenru was, was done. Yeah, I mean, Tenru, that was that match was dangerous for Okada. So he yes. was a, yeah. But, but the reason why I think that match worked and this one didn't <laughs> is they went into the ring with the intention of having a match like this. Okada's going to kind of run the show. Tenru's going to do some stuff. So they start doing some spots, and I think Okada quickly realized, oh, shit, this guy can't do anything. And Tenru realized, oh, shit, I can't do anything. And then, and you talked about this in the piece, there is a, a moment where it's clear that they talk to each other, and Okada just says, you know what, dude? Fuck it. Just start pu- fucking punching me, man. Just beat the fuck yeah. out of me. I'm going to yeah. hit you with some hard drop kicks. We're just going to hit each other really hard. Because it's not believable that I'm going toe to toe with you anymore, and it's not believable that 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 you're beating me up when I'm 24 years old and you're you know 63 or whatever the hell he was at the time. It's just it it's not going to be believable. And they quickly realized in that match, a few minutes in, this isn't going to work. We have to change course. And the match that they created was fucking awesome because it was Tenru, the old guy that knew this is it for me. This is my last match. This is my last moment of glory. Realizing I can't hang with this guy. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna fucking punch him. I'm going to kick him. I'm going to punch him. I'm going to drop on his neck. It was, it, there were some parts that were pretty dangerous. Like you said, there were some things that were definitely dangerous, but that's what was awesome about that match is it, it, it worked to the story of this guy is old. This guy doesn't have it anymore, but what he's going to do is he's got, he's got the he one thing fight. he can do. He can fight. He's going to fight to the literal death of this guy's career. This match was Goshi Ozaki sitting there slowly working over Mudo, slowly working him over, slowly working him over until it was finally time for Mudo to hit the flash pin and beat him. And that sucks. That was just garbage. I, I, I didn't think it was like a horrendous match, but I thought it was. I, I went like three stars with it. I just thought it was a boring way to end Go Shiozaki's run. And just no, you I didn't know. think. Look, I thought it was dull, and I thought one guy clearly was not having a good night. Um, but yeah, I mean the Tenru Okada match. It was less dangerous once he started shooting on him. Yeah, it was dangerous when he attempted to work, and then they just said, "Just beat me up," because that's just superficial. That's bruises and cuts. You know, that's that that stuff heals. But he dropped them at one point going for like a power bomb or something, I think. And I was like, wow, he's going to he's going to hurt him. And then they changed course. Muto lost control of Shiozaki's body a couple times in this match. Yep. Um, you know, I just think maybe this worked for some nostalgia fans. But and, and, and again, I don't think it's going to be harmful. And I get the idea. I understand the train of thought. Here's the other thing. I'm not confident Kiyomiya beats him. 
they're not running it like I thought. Okay, if they do it on the Masawa. Uh, oh, they, now that he's now that he's signed, I'm not I'm not confident. If this, if if there was no signing and there was no sort of pop and circumstance that he's here. I would have said, oh, yeah, it's obvious that he's going to do honors to, to, to Kiyomi and get out of there. But there's going to be a lot of people eating crow when Go Shiozaki hits a fucking Shining Wizard and pins this guy in the middle of the ring. Or when uh, when Mudo hits a Shining Wizard and pins this guy in the middle of the ring. Like, I don't, I wouldn't bet that that's going to happen, but it's not a 0% chance anymore. I, I'd put they're it at 40. I'd put it at 45 big, for sure. They're not doing it on a big enough, I, like, the, the show they're doing it on, it's possible that Muto retains. Yeah. I mean, which I, you know. Which kind of throws that argument out the window of, oh, well, he'll just be the transition champ and he'll put over Kiyomiya. Get the rub. But it's like, even if he does, okay, well, now Kiyomiya is one in one versus this fucking dinosaur. I right. mean, is he really. And Go Shiozaki, the guy that beat everybody else on your roster, is, is 0 and 1 versus him. So, great. Versus this guy. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> I just think it's a bad look. I just don't think it's a great look. I don't have any problem booking Muto. I didn't have any problem with this match. No, yeah, he's um, fine on an undercard. He's fine on a midcard. Yeah, I just no, I don't. No, I don't even have a problem with him in that main event. I just don't think he should have won. You know, it's like it was. I thought the story of him chasing the third title that he never won, and Go had beaten everybody else. I don't have a problem putting Mudo in that match in that building where you have to sell some tickets and everything else. My problem is that I don't think him winning is nearly as beneficial as other people think. I don't think he means that much. You know, and I got to tell you something else. I wasn't impressed with the reaction that he got. I don't know where you stand on that, but he gets the pin and the crowd is shocked. They're clearly shocked because they can't believe he he won and it's the flash pin. But then after that, it's just polite clapping. And if you go back and watch, okay, it's right there on the videotape. Go back and watch. After he wins, they scan the crowd and people just look bored. Like every other person's like politely clapping. Everyone else is kind of just staring at the ring. Some of that is they're in shock, I guess, that they had the balls to do the title change. And then the post-match stuff, there's no like palpable buzz in the crowd. You don't have people on their feet. He's leaving the ringside area, going up the ramp, and it's just some very light, polite clapping. I don't even feel like, and it's hard to tell with the clap crowds. I get it. But I don't even feel like there was even a different kind of energy in that building for this win. I, but again, with the clap crowds, who knows? So I don't want to make a huge deal out of that. But um, I don't know. Just none of this worked for me. I had a feeling I think, they were going to do it. I just wonder if Western it's, fans maybe, and I don't know. I, I don't live in Japan. I don't I don't talk to it. But like, is it possible that people just don't see the same appeal to, know, uh, to, to, to Keiji Muto? Like your modern twenty twenty one fans, especially your Noah fans. I mean, why would they have any attachment to Mudo? Again, when is when is there any evidence the last ten years that this guy is? Something That's what I mean. Wrong? So it's like I don't know. I like now, you're probably right. I don't know that I'd be really surprised because it's like yeah, yeah, fucking this guy hasn't went away. It's not like it, like Mudo's been there. He's been in Wrestle One. He's been in, in in different places. He was in all Japan for years and years and years. But yeah, we saw the Wrestle One thing, and that was that was fine. That, I got my my you know. Well, the counter argument would be okay. People are going to be more interested in him chasing the GHC title. Than they are going to be with him wrestling in Wrestle One, and that's that's valid. But again, this is a guy who's been freelancing and doing his thing for the last decade and working matches like this. I, I just think it, the idea that he's some big difference maker is at this stage of his career is vastly overrated. I yeah, just, especially I, Noah. I mean, he really does not. We talked about it last week. Like people just kind of assume, oh, Keiji Muto, but like he's got no attachment to Noah ever. He popped in every so often in, you know, the, the the late years. But, like, yeah, he wasn't, like, an original Noah guy. He wasn't, like, in the in the, in the mix there. He, he did a few shots in, in, you know, 2011, 2012, 2004. But that's it. Like, he's got – he had, like, five or six Noah matches before this this last run that we're talking about here. It's not like a guy that, like, if you're a real dyed-in-the-wool Noah fan and, and, and you know, Go Shiozaki – we always heard the long thing on Go Shiozaki was that, you know, he had, he had left and, you know, all that sort of stuff and he wasn't, you know, true to no, – all that sort of stuff. Like, if you're a Noah fan, like, who the fuck do you care about Keiji Muto for? Yeah, you know, I'm just not a big nostalgia guy. I just – look, when, you're, when, when I feel like you're done, I'm done with you because credibility is really important to me in pro wrestling. And, and if I feel like the opponents have to work down – to you because of your age or your physical state i'm no longer interested it just wasn't believable that that this go shiozaki guy who's run through this entire roster can't just take this guy's head off and beat him in 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 10 minutes you know what i mean and like but some people are into nostalgia like that some people like seeing their old favorite i get it that has never moved me and maybe 
it's one of those things where us as sports fans, when guys are done, they're done. And it's like, you rather see them go out gracefully. And I don't, you know, I can't buy the idea that, yeah, it's just the match was hard for me to buy. Yeah, this know. this to me, it, it, it really like, <laughs> in a weird way, you mentioned like the sports thing. Like it reminded me of, of uh, last year uh, when all the pandemic stuff was going on. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, Vince Carter was in a, a, a game for the Atlanta Hawks. They put him in, in the game because they realized, oh, fuck, the season's going to get canceled. This thing's not going to happen. And it's going to be the last game for Vince Carter ever. So what happened is they put him in the game and just like everybody just kind of like gets out of his way. <laughs> he just starts taking shots. You're just trying to make a three to like go out with a score so everybody can cheer. But you know what I mean? It was so like just not the way I didn't want. I don't want Vince Carter to go out that way. You, you know what I mean? With like people like handing him the ball. Like, come on, buddy. Shoot it. Shoot it. Shoot it. But like yeah, yeah. that's how this felt. Like Goshizaki sitting there like, all right, like let's just have some fun. Like it just it wasn't believable that he was a real athlete uh, on the level of Goshizaki, especially Goshizaki in his prime, all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I don't I just don't buy that the aura of Muda is the same as it is when he's 58 and can barely walk or barely move or, or do any move competently. It's just yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, when you're trying to suspend your disbelief, we just saw this guy take an epic beating from Takashi Sagara. Now I'm supposed to believe that he can't put away this guy? I, I, I mean, and it really did feel like he was working down to his level. Mm-hmm. And I don't like beating up Keiji Muto. I, I like Keiji No, Muto. I like him too, but yeah. 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 When, when you're the fucking GHC champion, we're going to beat you up if you, you can't walk. Yeah, if you can't, if you can't do it. I mean, you know, and it's... Um, you know, this was like Goldberg and Undertaker just shit in the bed in Saudi Arabia. I mean, right. it wasn't at that level. I'm not trying to suggest that the match was that bad because it wasn't. But it's it's very similar in that it you know it was very clear that Undertaker in his last few efforts just couldn't do it anymore. You know, and it, it's and was getting by on charisma. And I don't think Muto's all that much different than late stage Undertaker at this point. And, um, you know, it, it's and and. Look, I just saw a match against Kiyomiya that I thought was very good. It's not like he's incapable. This, to me, though, didn't work. And I think that maybe if I was more nostalgic, it may have helped it. But I'm just not very nostalgic when it comes to this stuff. I feel like when wrestlers are done, they just need to go away or work lower on the yeah, car. Or work, yeah, I have no issue. Like, I have no problem with older wrestlers being involved in stuff. And I, I honestly, like you said, I have no issue with an older wrestler being in a main event or doing something like that. It has nothing to do with age. It's all about how you, you know, can you go and, and is it believable that you're in the ring there? But, yeah, some people love those matches that are just, you know, seven old, you know, eight, eight old dudes that can barely walk, you know, facing each other. And it's like, I don't really, this doesn't do anything for me. Like, I don't need to see Fujiwara and, and Dory Funk Jr., you know, lock up that doesn't do anything for me man <laughs> like, and... like there were times where nakanishi would channel he would have that once a year match where it was like whoa yes did you see that yeah, nakanishi yeah, yeah. match but it's like it was we're still holding him to the standard of terrible broken down nakanishi if they were putting him in main events i'd have the same complaints like yeah if he was winning a g1 in, 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 in 2016 I, I yeah we would say what the hell are they doing that's so stupid it doesn't it's not believable that you know kenny omega is selling to manabu nakanishi in a g1 final it just wouldn't make sense so and i don't want people to think i'm comparing manabu nakanishi to keiji muto i mean obviously one is one of the biggest stars in the history of the business sure and the other, and the other guy is fucking uh is kurosawa okay i'm not comparing the two apples to apples but just to kind of hammer home the point we're making. Anyway, bottom line is this. Match didn't work for me. I thought it was dreadfully boring. I thought Shiozaki had to work down to the guy. Just didn't work. Um, I didn't. I don't like the booking. I don't think – I don't get the sense the booking is going to be damaging. But I also don't get the sense that it's going to help. And I really do believe that Kiyomiya would have been helped more by beating Muto the first time and then being the guy to end Shiozaki's title reign. Yeah, I just Those think it's way like cleaner. Teams. Yeah, I think it's just way cleaner that way. I mean, Go Shizaki yeah. ends his run on uh, you know on the top, losing to the young kid that worked his way up. But it's just like that just makes all the sense in the world. But whatever you want to do, what this little story. What about the argument that now you have the Kiyomiya Shiozaki match still in your back pocket for when Kiyomiya does win the title? Okay, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, I guess that's valid, but again, I think he gets more out of beating Shio. Yeah, here's what it comes down to: we're not. We think the idea that beating Muto is this huge deal is overrated. That's what it comes down to. Right, right, if right. You, if you still think that's a big deal, then you think this is the right move. I think this ceased being a big deal at least 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I'm, I'm with you. The last 10 years, I don't think it really means anything anymore. Because the other thing about Muto is he doesn't really go away. 
He's a constant presence. That's what somewhere. I said. Like people have this idea that he's like. I mean, he's been wrestling consistently for <laughs> decades. It, he was in Wrestle One, then he was doing Crossing Masters. Remember Masters? They were really successful. That was his company too. That did really well too. Yay! Uh, yeah, it's like he's never left. He's always been there. <laughs> so it's like I, I, yeah, I don't have that attachment to him that that other people have. Like they haven't never seen this guy. Oh my god, it's KG Muto. Oh my god, yeah. Not even necessarily the attachment, just the idea that I don't think he has the same aura. Because he, he we keep seeing him and he never really looks impressive. Because he's never gone away, I think that has hurt his aura. Whereas maybe if somebody else made it, like if Kenta Kobashi came back by some miracle and could, it, and could move at least as much as Muto can, that would mean something because he hasn't wrestled in fucking eight, nine years or whatever it is. Muto has been a constant presence. So that's another reason why I don't think beating him is, is, is going to have the impact that people think it's going to have. So I don't know. I just think it's a – maybe they think it's a move that will get them some attention. Look, if we're going to bury WWE for this, I don't see why we wouldn't bury Noah for this. Yep. It's the same thing to me. I don't think it's any different than bringing back Goldberg or, or any of these other guys, except I think I find Goldberg far more credible. No, yeah. I, if Keiji Muto beat Goshi Ozaki in two minutes, I might have actually liked it a little bit more than this. So, Right. Well, that you know, you hide his weaknesses maybe, but I, I mean I still wouldn't like it, but – um you know, whatever. I, uh, you know, it's just hopefully he loses. I, I'm, I'm worried that he doesn't even lose. To it's going to take Keo Mio like two tries. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe we all thought we had this figured out, but maybe that's not even the play. Maybe he's going to beat him again. I mean, they signed him to a two-year contract. Well, he's going to wrestle three times a year. But I mean, what do you do with him if he just goes out in a month and loses the title? Then what do you do with the that's guy? That's what I mean. You years? got two more years now to to figure out. Yeah, I, that that when, when that two year deal thing came down, I kind of wanted to tell those people, tell me, oh well, it's also he can lose to Kiyomi, and I'm like, eh, don't uh, don't don't count the chickens before they hatch. Let's you know. All right, what you think? What you think of the rest of the show? Uh, I kind of thought it stunk. Did you think it stunk? I wouldn't use the word stunk, but I thought it was I just like it. a show. If yeah, it was uh, Noah's had far better shows over the last year than than this one. I thought uh, oh, the GHC heavyweight t- uh, the junior heavyweight title match w- w- was solid. Uh, the junior heavyweight tag match was solid. Really much everything with the juniors I enjoyed. Everything with the heavyweights was yeah too old. There's just a lot of old guys on this show. It I was... gotta tell you, I didn't. The one match I haven't seen is Kano versus Funaki, so I can't comment. You on know, that. weird enough, I didn't actually not finish. I, I as we're reading this, I went fuck. I didn't watch that match, so I didn't see it. Either, All right, so disclaimer: so. we didn't see Kano versus Funaki. Because I'm thinking, Funaki's I saw the whole show and I'm looking. Fuck, I didn't watch that match. What the hell happened? I don't know what happened. So uh, there was nothing to speak of on like the pre-show, uh, the pre-pay-per-view part of the show. Um, and we're running out of time, so we'll just blow through. Yeah, some yeah, of yeah. This, we'll but, go quick. Um. The big multi-man tag with Sagara Gun versus Congo. I mean, it was fine. I mean, um, really, nothing much to comment on. No, I, I, yeah, think, I thought it was. I didn't even think it was fine. I thought it was pretty terrible. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just what do you want me to do? Bury this fucking lower card match. I mean, <laughs> it, yeah, I, you, I mean, you're right. There was nothing much to it. Uh, Masaki Mochizuki and Masato Tanaka against Yone and Tanaguchi. Um, it's fine. It was okay. It was okay. I, I I came in with higher expectations for this match, and it it, it didn't quite match. I don't know why, well, given that you know Yone and <laughs> Tenakuchi are on the other side, but I, I thought that Masato Mochizuki and Masato Tanaka was too much to uh, uh to overcome. You you couldn't overcome their greatness, but uh, they it was it was fine. Uh, Tanaguchi is very hit or miss, and Yone just is what he is. He's just a five. Mm-hmm. He's, he's just a five out of ten every time out, which is fine for his place on the card. Um. Hayata and Ogawa successfully defended against Katero Suzuki and Akuto Hidaka. It was okay. It was a good match. Nice little three star match. Um, the thing is, I don't have a, any more like hot takes on this show. Like I thought everything was was okay. Yeah, I know. Really... That's yeah. Other than the main event, the rest of the show that I saw, I was like, yeah, that was fine. Like in a, mostly inoffensive, but nothing that I could really say. Go out of your way to watch. Uh, I can't recommend any of this. No, yeah. I can't recommend. I will say they didn't do any of the junior shuffling this time around. I know. I was waiting after the match thinking, uh, all right, here we go. And they just kind of left the ring. And I was like, oh, all right, never mind. I guess. <laughs> can we just call it what it is? This match, this entire show was geared towards lapsed fans. Yep. The entire show. Okay. Ogawa won. Muto won. Saito Funaki, won. The Funaki was on the show. You had fucking... Um, Sagara with his band of fucking old guys 
uh, on the show. They all won. You don't even need to book these guys. You have Kendo Cashin as the next challenger for the <laughs> national title. This is for – they're stinks. trying to recap. They're, they are trying to recapture lapsed fans. Great. And how yeah, many well, Kendo Cashin is a great way to do that. Yeah, there you go. How many companies are going to fall on their face trying to do this? I don't know. It doesn't work. Around the entire world. New stars, young stars, new energy. It going does back not to work. Fujita again and going back to Kendall Kashin again is not what's going to do it. No one has cared about Ironhead Fujita in 15 fucking years. It's not going to work. No one has cared about Kendall Kashin ever. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if, if, of all the guys, really don't know that I pushed Kendall Kashin. But, uh... I mean, that, that's what this, this show was, was entirely built for uh, nostalgia fans. It's a shame, you know. It's it's again. I don't think it's going to hurt them, but it's not going to help them. This this strategy never works. Yeah, I mean this, and and you know, I had this entire idea as well. Is that when we were when we're going to Budokan Hall, if if it was going to be a full Budokan Hall, life was normal and all that sort of stuff. Okay, I get it. You want to book some of the older guys, and maybe some Flaps fans are going to watch or whatever. But given that the attendance, you know, four thousand one hundred ninety six, I don't know how what the, the the percentage that they could do or whatever. But to me, there's no better way to show off Noah, show off a brand new logo, return to Budokan Hall with saying, "Hey, here are the new stars of Pro Wrestling." Noah Goshi Ozaki is our champion. He just got done running this, you know, great. You know, he, he, he had the best reign of all time. He was a, a Tokyo Sports winner, all that sort of stuff. And here's Kano. He's the national champion, and he's awesome. And he, you know, he's he's great. And here's Kato Kimi, and he's the next guy up, and he's he's doing this. And here's you know uh, uh, Yoshiaka, and, and and he's gonna win the junior heavyweight title. And he's really good. And there was like elements of that throughout the show but like the foot forward that i would have done is say here are all of our young fucking stars here are the great wrestlers that have gotten us back to budokan we've gone back to budokan on the backs of these guys by saying hey here's a bunch of old dudes like i don't know to me it's just yeah it, it's it's the wrong perception that i want noah to have right now because i think noah's done a great job of building himself back up to to, to be able to run budokan hall because i think if, if if life was normal this would be a very a pretty well attended show and it'd be a pretty well attended show because of what they've done with ghost Yuzaki and what they've done with kano and what they've done with kiyomiya not because you know kazushi sakuraba's on the undercard but whatever as their big Budokan show, they brought back all the olds, but I would like to see fresh new directions myself. I will just leave it at that. Um, I was not thrilled with this show. Um, didn't love the main event. Didn't think anything on the undercard was uh, anything great, um, you know, with the qualifier that I haven't seen the semi yet. And I've been enjoying Kano's stuff a lot. So we'll see. I'm not excited about seeing Kendo Kashin against him, though, at all. Yeah. I don't th- I know how anybody can be. I mean, he's beaten a bunch of the shooters. I get it. Can we move on and do something else with Kano now? He's beaten enough of these guys. Do we really have to have a Kendo Kashin match? Got, got to dig even... up the early 2000s shooters that weren't successful even in the early 2000s and see what we can do with those guys. So, perfect. Oh. Great. All right. Well. Great. Anyway. All right. Let's uh, hey. quickly here. We got about five minutes left to go. Uh, real quick, uh, AW Women's Eliminator Tournament, the Japan Bracket. Uh, you and I have both watched the the shows. They're on YouTube as well. Excalibur doing uh, English commentary solo. I thought he did a pretty good job. Uh, production was what we expected, like not televised. <laughs> you cannot put that on TNT whatsoever. Empty Arena was what the Ice Ribbon Dojo, right, in, in Japan. Basically an empty arena with a banner that's at AEW on it. But uh, I thought a pretty fun hour of wrestling. I enjoyed what they did, and I, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see the rest of this tournament. But uh, what would you think of the AEW Women's Eliminator Tournament? Well, we got two more quick topics here. We've got the AEW Women's Tournament. And then uh, we're going to do this blood sport. That's everything we have. Right? Yeah, we can get through blood sport in two minutes. Let's, uh, I'll tell you what. Let's shut it down. Let's put those two on the overrun. I don't let's know if we do. We even have the overrun on. active anymore? I don't think we, we do. do. We're going to activate the overrun. So okay. uh, I say we uh, we shut this down because we've already gone over three hours. So uh, if you want to hear about the AEW uh, women's tournament on the Joshi side and uh, a quick rundown of blood sport. We're going to do that uh, behind the paywall and the overrun. That's the $5 tier. So let's uh, let's get the plugs in, wrap up the free version of the show. AEW, uh, Joshi side, the Japanese side of the tournament, and Bloodsport uh, behind the paywall on the other side on the overrun. There you go. Patreon.com uh, slash Voice of Wrestling. So that is it for us on this show, the live show here. Uh, but we will do. Uh, we'll, we'll record it. It'll be up on the uh, the, the, the Patreon very quickly after uh, for those uh, listening uh, on uh, on uh, 
on the live feed. So uh, patreon.com slash voice of wrestling for that. Uh, I also want to thank our uh, sponsors, Upstart, upstart.com slash VOW, and also keeps, keeps.com slash VOW as well uh, for both of those. Uh, and that's it for Joe and Rich, and well, that's it for us. So we'll uh, see you on the other side for the overrun. Take care. <laughs>